Excuse me, if we have people who are unmuted, please mute so we can move forward. With that objection, the chair is authorized to declare recess of the committee at any time. I intend to conclude today's hearing at approximately one o'clock. So that means everybody is going to be kept uh, to the exact time uh, that they're allowed at the five minutes. This hearing is entitled, The Annual Testimony of the Secretary of the Treasury on the State of the International Financial System. I now recognize myself for four minutes to give an opening statement. I would like to welcome Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, who today is presenting testimony for the first time on the state of the international financial system. This is a very timely hearing, given that it is the international financial system established by the United States and its allies after World War II that has enabled the West to hit the Russian economy with unprecedented force in response to the travesty and brutality of Putin's war against Ukraine. The most powerful sanctions to date have blocked Russia's largest financial institution and its central bank from the global financial system. I commend President Biden and Secretary Yellen for their leadership in coordinating these efforts with our allies. In support of these efforts, I recently sent a letter to the trade associations representing our nation's financial institutions, asking them to report how U.S. businesses are doing their part to exit Russia and block funding for Putin's war on crimes. So I look forward to their fulsome um, responses. The utility of our allies in helping Ukraine did not occur by accident, the unity that is. In fact, this unity is a direct result of the Biden administration's efforts to renew the U.S. commitment to global economic cooperation. President Biden signaled this commitment last year with his first budget proposal when boosted U.S. contributions to the multilateral development banks, global climate finance efforts, and food insecurity programs by 73%. This was followed by Secretary Yellen's support for a new allocation of special drawing rights at the International Monetary Fund, which provided $275 billion liquidity boost to emerging economies to help them respond to the global pandemic. There will also be a new test of the strength of the international financial system and its international financial institutions, which will enter on the ability and which will center on the ability and willingness of Western nations to adequately respond to the humanitarian, energy, security, and food insecurity crisis caused by the war in Ukraine. But our work is not done. This committee recently marked up legislation to further isolate Russia and support Ukraine, including my bill, the Nowhere to Hide Oligar Oligarchs Asset Act that assists FinCEN in identifying the yachts, the luxury apartments, and other assets of Putin's cronies. We will continue to keep the pressure on Putin. Additionally, my committee continues to pay close attention to the challenges faced in the Caribbean, including a lack of access to international banking services. So I want to see a concerted effort by international financial institutions to focus on the Caribbean and show the world that development is possible even under the most challenging circumstances. So Secretary Yellen, I look forward to your testimony. I now recognize the ranking member of the committee, the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. McHenry, for four minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I thank you, Secretary Yellen, for, for appearing before the committee. Uh, it's been a long time coming. Uh, I know Democrats control the House and the Senate and the White House, but our expectation is that the Treasury Secretary comply with uh, uh, the law and appear before our committee and other committees uh, as the law dictates. So we're grateful you're here. Uh, but this is uh, long overdue, especially considering the Russia-Ukraine conflict. Um, and also what we note on Capitol Hill, uh, that the Chinese, uh, the Chinese government is, um, is taking notes, especially to the U.S. response uh, in this conflict. Uh, the Biden administration's sanctions have helped isolate the Russian economy. That's good. But it was reactive at, at best. Uh, we watched as Russia amassed troops at the border last fall all the while claiming 
no plans for invasion. Uh, a claim parroted by uh, Chinese officials as late as February 23rd even. Um, and at the same time, we see, at the same time all of this is happening with Russia and Ukraine, we see China's continued activities in the uh, Taiwan Straits, and they're telling us that supporting Taiwan is, quote, dangerous, end quote, to our relationship. Uh, we must remain clear-eyed about who we're dealing with here. China must feel the pinch of its no-limit partnership with Russia. Uh, while the Biden administration eventually sanctioned Russia, it also unwittingly pro uh, provided <clears throat> a means by which China could help Russia circumvent those sanctions. Let me explain. Last year, the Department, the Treasury Department, bypassed Congress and approved a general allocation of International Monetary Fund Special Drawing Rights, SDRs, sending Russia and Belarus more than $18 billion dollars uh, in, in de facto $18 billion in no strings attached liquidity. Uh, state sponsors of terrorism like Iran and Syria received billions more, by the way. Uh, Republicans warned that an SDR allocation ran counter to U.S. sanctions policy. As the Putin regime continues its assault on Ukraine, it is clear our concerns were justified. And yet even OFAC, uh, seeks to block Russia's access to foreign reserves. At the same time, uh, our country uh, allowed SDRs to become a lifeline uh, that the Russians may exchange for Chinese currency, for the Chinese RMB. Now, U.S. officials have to ask foreign countries not to redeem um, the same, the very same Russia SDRs this administration pushed for uh, just, just a few months ago. Uh, this policy doesn't make any sense. That was a bad decision. Uh, uh, and I think it's important that uh, the public recognize and this administration recognize that Congress is a partner in this fight, this international fight that we have. It is the Treasury Department that has a duty to keep us informed. Uh, to date, we have yet to receive certain reports related to the international financial institutions under your remit. This includes policies regarding China, Taiwan, and efforts against uh, terrorism financing uh, generally. I appreciate the Treasury's work in terrorism and financial intelligence. It's good work. But here, too, uh, the Treasury must respect the oversight of Congress, um, and it's simply unacceptable that Treasury officials have dodged public hearings for as long as they have. Uh, we have to work to ensure that we have maximum pressure on Moscow so that the Putin regime changes course in Ukraine. But at the same time, we cannot keep our eye off the challenge that China poses and the risks uh, that uh, a rising China uh, uh, poses to the stability of the world. So, Secretary Yellen, thank you for being here. Uh, and uh, with that, Chairwoman, I yield back. Thank you very much, uh, Ranking Member McHenry. I now recognize the gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Himes, for one minute. Thank you, Madam Chair. And Madam Secretary, welcome uh, over here, Siberia. Um, I've been in dozens of these hearings with at least four secretaries of the Treasury. I can't remember a hearing in which our cooperation and unified action were more necessary. As we speak, Russian troops are raping women, they're murdering military-aged men, and they're targeting children in Ukraine. I don't think anyone in this room will ever forget the images that we saw of Russian barbarism in Bucha. So our mission is clear. Democrats and Republicans, legislature and executive, we must do all we can to help Ukraine win this war. We must show the Russian people that the nation of Tolstoy and Tchaikovsky will be completely isolated with a Stone Age economy as long as they are governed by a butcher. And whether it takes one year or ten, Vladimir Putin must answer to the laws and the standards of decency that he mocks. So I have just one question today, which is what more can we do to help the people of Ukraine and the survival of our democracy. I now recognize the gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Barr, for one minute. Secretary Yellen, thanks for being back with us. And uh, I just want to compliment my uh, friend from Connecticut. Uh, I couldn't uh, say it better myself. I will say one thing we could do more is to sanction the energy-related transactions, which we are not doing. Um, Russia's war in Ukraine highlights the important role of the Office of Foreign Asset Control within Treasury to put economic pressure on Putin and the Russian military. U.S. sanctions coordinated with our allies have had some effect, but we can do more, as I said. 
The atrocities on display, especially in recent days, necessitate that the U.S. use its full sanctions power, including comprehensively limiting Russia's ability to profit from oil and gas sales. We are not sanctioning energy-related transactions. We need to do so now. The IMF is also at a crossroads. The fund plays an important role in promoting international macroeconomic stability, yet scandals at the top of the organization and its mission creep into issues like climate change create a lack of confidence in its leadership. This hearing will focus on Treasury's representation of U.S. interests at IFIs, and I look forward to today's testimony. Thank you very much. I want to welcome the Honorable Janet Yellen, Secretary of the United States Department of the Treasury. Without objection, your written statement will be made part of the record. You will have five minutes to summarize your testimony. You should be able to see a timer that will indicate how much time you have left on your testimony. Secretary Yellen, you are now recognized for five minutes to present your testimony. Thank you, Chairman Waters, Ranking Member McHenry, and members of the committee, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today. I'm here to discuss Treasury's oversight of the International Financial Institutions, or IFIs, and our role in promoting inclusive and sustainable growth, global monetary and financial stability, and development. Over the last two years, the IFIs have led the way in helping low-income and developing countries fight the COVID-19 pandemic. Since the beginning of the crisis, the IMF has approved nearly $175 billion in emergency lending, concessional financing, debt service relief, and precautionary support to fund pandemic response and economic recovery efforts. The multilateral development banks, or MDBs, approved nearly $130 billion over the same period to address the health, economic, and social impacts of the pandemic. Treasury's pressed the World Bank to work with international partners to improve vaccine readiness and support increased vaccine delivery in developing countries. As long as this pandemic is raging anywhere in the world, the American people will be vulnerable to new variants. The importance of the IFIs is even more paramount given Russia's brutal and unprovoked invasion of Ukraine. Russia's actions, including the atrocities committed against the innocent Ukrainians in Bucha, are re reprehensible, represent an unacceptable affront to the rules-based global order, and will have enormous economic repercussions in Ukraine and beyond. Treasury is committed to holding Russia accountable for its actions, so it cannot benefit from the international financial system. President Biden has rallied over 30 countries, representing well over half the world's economy, to impose swift, severe sanctions and export controls on Russia. Treasury is also working with our partners to block Russia from accessing benefits from the uh, international financial institutions. Both the World Bank and the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development had ceased approving new financing for Russia since the unlawful annexation of Crimea in 2014. Since the invasion, these institutions have announced further measures to prevent Russia's and Belarus's access to financial and non-financial assistance. Since the start of the war, rapid IMF and World Bank assistance has allowed Ukraine fiscal space to pay salaries for civilians, soldiers, doctors, and nurses, while also meeting its external debt obligations. The IMF, World Bank, and EBRD will be critical partners in rebuilding Ukraine, and they will also provide vital support to neighboring countries welcoming refugees. Spillovers from the crisis are heightening economic vulnerabilities in many countries that are already facing higher debt burdens and limited policy options as they recover from COVID-19. The IFIs will play a critical role in several areas. First, food security. Together, Russia and Ukraine account for nearly a third of the world's wheat exports. 
Russia's invasion disrupted the flow of food for millions of people around the world and caused prices to spike. The IFIs and food security funds are already working to address both the short-term and long-term effects of the invasion on global food prices and supplies. Second, energy security. The invasion of Ukraine has also underscored the need for sustainable, affordable, clean, and secure energy for economic growth and security for the United States, as well as for governments that partner with the IFES. The MDB's promotion of energy efficiency and capital investment toward diverse energy sources like solar, wind, and other non-fossil fuel-based energy sources and away from suppliers such as Russia that strengthens energy security and reduces short-term fossil fuel price risks, all while addressing the long-term threat of climate change. Public finance alone cannot meet this challenge, so Treasury is encouraging the MDBs to undertake reforms and adopt more ambitious targets for mobilizing private capital, particularly through their private sector windows. Many low-income countries are facing growing debt burdens as the pandemic continues into a third year. The IFI supported the G20's debt service suspension initiative from 2020 to 2021, which helped eligible countries free up resources to use toward pandemic support. The IMF and World Bank are now supporting the Common Framework for Debt Treatments, which seeks to help low-income countries address their longer-term debt-related vulnerabilities. The recent record replenishment of the World Bank's concessional window, the International Development Association, will help deliver critical financing to the world's poorest and most vulnerable to address these impacts at a moment of urgent need. Finally, the Biden administration is seeking congressional authorization to provide financing to bolster the Poverty Re Reduction and Growth Trust, the IMF's existing concessional facility, and the new IMF Resilience and Sustainability Trust, the PRGT has been stretched by the exceptional amount of COVID-19 financing provided and needs additional funding. The new RST will provide targeted financing alongside IMF programs to support countries' efforts to strengthen energy security and pandemic preparedness. I look forward to working with you to continue to advance U.S. economic leadership abroad and create opportunities for Americans at home. I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you very much. I now recognize myself for five minutes for questions. And while you will probably get a lot of questions today about Ukraine, uh, this is an international financial architecture that we're looking at. And for years, I've been concerned about how our Caribbean neighbors are treated in the international community by U.S. financial institutions and by our own government. In particular, I'm concerned that as a result of United States government actions and overly cautious U.S. banks, countries like Barbados, the Bahamas, Jamaica, and others have been cut off from access to capital and credit, de-risking as this issue is called, has direct and negative effects on the ability for the Caribbean to build businesses, employ citizens, facilitate economic development, and allow families to send and receive funds from abroad. De-risking has consequences for the United States as well. The Caribbean region is both geographically and historically close to the United States, and it is not only an important trading partner, but also a strong, reliable ally in security cooperation. This is why this committee passed legislation, which was signed into law through the Anti-Money Laundering Act of 2020 that directs the Treasury to lead a government-wide strategy on de-risking 
and provide that strategy to Congress later this year. Madam Secretary, can you speak to the importance of the Caribbean region to the United States and what the Treasury is doing to address de-risking, including Treasury's progress on the strategy? Thank you for that uh, question, Chair Waters. Um, financial inclusion, of course, is a very important goal of the United States and the Treasury Department, and we have been concerned about de-risking in the Caribbean and other areas of the world. I, I would say that in spite of that, the United States um, has one of the lowest costs of uh, sending remittances of any country in the world, and we have seen remittances increase considerably. The data that we have on the Caribbean um, shows that uh, there have been a significant increase in remittances there and to Latin America more generally. Um, there, there are diverse drivers of de-risking. One issue is profitability concerns of banks that have led them to cut back. Um, also changes in global business strategy following the 2009-10 financial crisis. Um, our AML CFT rules may be a further contributor to de-risking, and to the extent that that's true, we think the best way forward is for jurisdictions um, to make meaningful and publicly visible improvements to their AML CFT regimes. That's something that will give foreign financial institutions confidence that they're operating in an environment in which they can mitigate the risks effectively. And um, Treasury um, is happy to engage in dialogues and provide support to jurisdictions that are seeking to make those changes. Thank you. In the interest of time, uh, I yield. The gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. McHenry, who is a ranking member of the committee, is now recognized for five minutes. Uh, Secretary Yellen, thank you for being here. Um, as we know, Russia is still earning hundreds of millions of dollars each day in hard currency through its oil and gas exports. Even though the president banned Russian oil imports, which I welcome, uh, Treasury continues to provide sanctions licensing for banks transacting uh, in, in transactions related to Russian energy. This includes financial services allowing other countries to import Russian oil and gas. Why are these licenses being provided? So we are working very closely with our partners to have a coordinated set of sanctions. And our goal from the outset has been to impose maximum pain on Russia while to the best of our ability shielding the United States and our partners of undue um, economic harm. I've publicly committed the administration's approach on sanctions. What I'm particularly asking about are the licenses uh, permitting bank transactions related to Russian energy. Well, in, in following up what I just um, indicated, um, Unfortunately, many of our European partners remain heavily dependent on Russian natural gas as well as oil. And they are committed to making the transition away from that dependence as rapid as possible. We're doing all we can to help. But in the meantime, we issued this license and they have taken steps um, to make sure that there can be a continued flow of Russian natural gas and, and oil. The, and if the Europeans take more stronger action against Russian energy, your, your uh, department would take stronger action as well? Well, we, we're working closely with them on sanctions and okay. um, want to remain aligned with them. So I, I want to pivot to China because I think the, the, uh, the, the government of China is, is watching us very closely. It's pretty clear that when Russian troops amassed on the eastern Ukraine border last fall, the administration lacked a cohesive strategy to respond. Uh, many of us have warned that a similar situation is occurring between China and Taiwan. 
Um, now, for example, Chairman Xi has vowed to, quote, smash, end quote, any attempts at independence by Taiwan. We've seen an unprecedented incursion by the Chinese into Taiwanese airspace, uh, including sending dozens of planes into Taiwan's air defense identification zone. Um, has the administration issued uh, a warning of sanctions or a threat of sanctions to Beijing to deter military action by China against Taiwan? So clearly the administration and the Treasury Department are opposed to any unilateral change in the status quo with respect to Taiwan. And we are working very closely with our partners in the administration to make sure that we have at our disposal tools to respond to provocations in that regard. I'm not going to comment on hypotheticals and what we would do in any particular scenario, but I will assure you that we are um, closely coordinating with all of our interagency partners to make sure that we will be able to respond appropriately. Has the administration contemplated a sanction strategy in the event of a Chinese uh, move against Taiwan? Um, I'm, I'm not going to comment on specifics. We have put sanctions in China on pla in place on China with respect to forced labor in Xinjiang and provocations um, with Hong Kong. Um, but um, certainly we are concerned about Taiwan and will act as appropriate. And, and that would include, I mean, uh, including uh, sanctioning senior leaders of, of the Chinese government as, as has been done with Russia and Russian oligarchs. I mean, uh, are you to say, am, am, am I to hear from you um, that you're open to all tools available in the event that China moves aggressively towards Taiwan? Absolutely. I believe we've shown that we can, in the case of Russia, we threatened significant consequences. We've imposed significant consequences. And I think that you should not doubt our ability and resolve to do this, the same in other situations. Thank you. Thank you very much. The gentlewoman from New York, Ms. Velasquez, who is also the chair of the House Committee on Small Businesses, now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Secretary Yellen, um, many of us on this committee are concerned about the potential use of cryptocurrencies and other digital assets to evade international sanctions imposed on Russia for its illegal invasion of Ukraine. The U.S. and other G7 nations recently pledged to work together to ensure the Russian state, its elites, and oligarchs will not be able to utilize digital assets to sidestep these sanctions. How is the Treasury Department working to carry out this pledge? Well, we, we are concerned about sanctions avoidance, and we recognize that digital assets um, present opportunities for doing exactly that. So first I would say that we're monitoring for any attempts to use cryptocurrency to evade our sanctions, and we have ample enforcement authority which we won't hesitate to use. Um, we are tracking carefully using all the tools at our disposal the assets of oligarchs and other sanctioned individuals. We're working very closely exchanging information on this with our partners in the so-called repo task force. The Department of Justice announced a new task force called Klepto Capture, which is designed to use US law enforcement resources um, to um, identify and prosecute sanctions evasion. And FinCEN issued an alert to financial institutions um, to help them uh, recognize uh, suspicious transactions in this regard. Thank you for that answer. Secretary Yellen, I want to commend the Treasury Department on yesterday's announcement sanctioning the virtual currency exchange Garnatex and Hydra. Russia's most prominent darknet market. 
On the one hand, I think this announcement demonstrates the concern I have about how the dark web and cryptocurrencies can be utilized for illicit and criminal behavior, and that cyber criminals operating in Russia often operate with support of Vladimir Putin and his regime, but more importantly, sends a message to Putin and cyber criminals around the world that the United States, in coordination with its allies, will continue to disrupt these networks and cut off all avenues for potential sanctions evasion by Russia. Uh, my next question, Secretary Yellen, is one of the many tragedies of Russia's illegal invasion of Ukraine is the refugee crisis it has created. The United Nations estimates um, 500,000 Ukrainians have already fled, and early estimates suggested that refugee totals could reach up to 4 million. Support for Ukrainian refugees could cost hosting states as much as $30 billion over the next year, according to some estimates. How is the Treasury Department working to assess and possibly alleviate the economic and financial impact the refugee crisis is having in other countries in the region. Thank you for that. We're very concerned about the refugee crisis. Um, we are monitoring this situation very carefully and recognize the enormous burden that it's going to place on host governments that are already struggling with um, other stresses because of the pandemic and their proximity to the conflict. So we're working with other agencies and also with international partners to support the host governments and the refugees themselves. And there'll be a variety of channels, bilateral support, multilateral support. We're working with the international financial institutions, and as an example, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development recently announced a $2 billion euro package uh, to support Ukraine and other um, afflicted countries, but this will be a high priority for us. Thank you, I yield back. Thank you very much. The gentlewoman from Missouri, Mrs. Wagner, is now recognized for five minutes. I uh, thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and Secretary Yellen, thank you for joining us today. Last month, I introduced the Isolate Russian Government Officials Act uh, to ensure that Russia becomes a pariah in certain international organizations. I was very pleased to see the committee pass this legislation unanimously in March. Could you? please reply you know, with a simple yes or no, unless you feel the need to elaborate, regarding Russia's involvement with the following groups that are within Treasury's jurisdiction. Secretary Yellen, should Russia be removed from the G20? So President Biden's made it clear, and I certainly agree with him, that it cannot be business as usual in any, for Russia, in any of the financial institutions. He's asked that Russia be removed from the, the G20, yes. and I've made clear to um, my colleagues in Indonesia Good. that um, we, we will not be participating in um, a number of meetings if the Russians Good. And I'm going to go down a few others because this is all codified now in my legislation that I hope will make it to the floor. Um, so I'm, I'm pleased to hear uh, you were echoing the position of the administration and certainly of this legislation vis-a-vis -vis the G20. Should Russia be removed from the Financial Action Task Force? Um, that's one that I haven't I haven't looked into. I'll I'll get back to you on that one, but um, its role certainly should. Um, be minimal. Please, please do as it is again part of this legislation. The media reported last month that Russia had quote stepped back from participating in the Financial Stability Board FSB, but it is still listed as a member. Should Russia be removed from the FSB? Well, certainly its rules should um, be mi be minimal. 
Well, I would hope it would be removed from the FSB, and this is what this leg the legislation does, that passed unanimously out of, um, out of committee. I will hope that the administration, and I believe that, the, the, uh, that it has indicated such. You know, these are not unilateral decisions of the United States, and each one of these organizations has its own set of membership. But we need to make a strong stance ourselves as leaders um, in we, these organizations. We, we have made clear that we do not want Russia to participate actively in these organizations. So that would be the FSB. Later this month, the IMF and World Bank will hold their spring meetings. Will Russia be re represented at those meetings, even virtually, and will you urge participants to refuse interacting with Russian officials? Well, Russia is a member of the IMF, and um, in spite of the fact that the great majority of IMF members, um, I think, agree that Russia's actions are horrific, um, it doesn't look like it would be possible, given the rules, to remove Russia's... I, I, I understand that, but, but what I'm saying is the U.S. Is, must lead and be strong in mm -hmm. our resolve on these sanctions and in, in making them the pariah in these we, organizations. So I would, I'd hope that you would urge participants to refuse interacting with Russian officials vis-a-vis -vis the IMF and World Bank. We will denounce Russia's actions in all of these four. Thank you very, very much. Um, moving on to China. As you know, China has faced major challenges in its real estate sector, including debt problems at one of its largest developers, Evergrande. China's opaque lending uh, abroad creates contingent liabilities of unknown size, and Chinese regulators have warned about a rise in non-performing loans. Beijing has also announced restrictions on private investment in news media, which would only tighten the Chinese Communist Party's control over information and make China's economy more opaque. In your view, Madam Secretary, which parts of the Chinese financial system pose the greatest risk to stability beyond China's borders? And what is Treasury doing in the FSOC, the Financial Stability Board, and elsewhere to mitigate this risk? Well, I, I do think that there is significant risks in the Chinese financial system, and the property sector is an example yes. of one where there are severe risks. Um, and importantly, a slowdown in the property sector beyond its global implications um, would probably weigh on China's uh, growth outlook, which would have impacts on its economic partners. And this is something we're carefully monitoring. If you have any other information um, on that, I, I'd appreciate it in writing. We can follow up. I, I, I'll yield back to the chair. Thank you. <coughs> the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Scott, who is also the chair of the House Agricultural Committee, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chair Lady. <clears throat> chair uh, Yellen, you and the Treasury Department have refused to sanction Russian oligarch Alashir Uzman, who is worth $20 million billion and who is also Vladimir Putin's favorite oligarch. <laughs> and I want to know why. Why would the U.S. Treasury Department issue a special license exempting this oligarch and making it legal for his identity entities to continue doing business as usual with our American companies when Putin is murdering Children, bombing hospitals, raping children, raping women. Why? So we have sanctioned a large number of Russian no, oligarchs. No, but my, my question is this. There's got to be a reason. We need to get answers to this. The international world is wondering why. And there's got to be a reason with the terrible deeds, the criminal crimes that 
this, that this administration is taking. And here you got Putin's favorite oligarch worth $20 billion being exempted and given the right to continue doing business. Answer me, please. Well, I can't, the world wants to know. I can't give you the details on a specific individual, but I can tell you that every day we continue to impose additional sanctions. This morning we announced um, just, just 15 minutes ago a further set of sanctions, um, including on Putin's children. Yeah, but... And, uh, um, sometimes beyond blocking an individual, when an individual owns um, companies, has an interest in companies, it's important Well, let us. me ask you this. My time is marching on. Tell me about your Office of Foreign Assets Control. What role did they play in this decision? They play an important role in preparing sanctions now, packages what, against individuals. What, uh, uh, Jerry Allen, this is serious here. This is becoming a black mark on our nation. We need an answer as to why. You may have a legitimate one. If it's the Office of Foreign Control, we need to know. If it had uh, some desperate situation in which the, to do otherwise would impact our own nation or our security, why? We, we work very closely with the State Department and the National Security Council in um, deciding on sanctions packages. Was there any internal disagreement within the Treasury's Department Office of Foreign Assets Control about how certain oligarchs would be protected from the deep economic impact on these sanctions. Why Putin's number one oligarch? That sends a false image of what we're doing. And, and, and let me tell you, our reputation as the world leader is at stake when these types of things are happening, and there's no explanation for it. So help us with okay. that. I, I'm not going to offer um, comments on this specific individual that we haven't sanctioned. I, have you I offered, you, have you refused to sanction others, key oligarchs? I Is there a pecking have, order? We have imposed a large number of sanctions on Russian oligarchs and continue to impose further ones where not finished. The gentleman's time has expired. Madam Chair, I would ask that you make arrangements with uh, Mr. Scott. If it's classified, uh, you may... Meet with him, uh, wh whomever you designate, but he needs an answer. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Chair from Lady. Oklahoma, Mr. Lucas, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Secretary Yellen, I'd like to discuss with you today a significant concern for me. The U.S. economy is facing significant challenges coming off the heels of a global pandemic that we're still studying the effects of. The U.S. economy is also experiencing supply chain backlogs and inflation at a 40-year high and the Russian invasion of Ukraine exasperates economic uncertainty. In Oklahoma, small businesses, farmers, ranchers are navigating surging gas prices and volatile agricultural markets for inputs like grain and fertilizer. In these uncertain times, investors seek to protect their retirement savings, to hedge risk, and of course, safeguard their businesses. As I'm sure you can appreciate, providing liquid markets to protect the U.S. economy in the face of substantial headwinds should be a priority. Unfortunately, I'm concerned about the volume and significance of rulemaking proposals coming out of the Securities and Exchange Commission in such a short amount of time runs counter to this goal. Since November, the SEC has proposed over 20 new major far-reaching rule changes. 
These rules impact every asset class under the SEC's jurisdiction. The sheer amount and complexity of these rulemakings, compounded with the short and simultaneous comment periods, and I note that short and in many cases simultaneous comment periods, could negatively impact markets and the public that depends on them. It's important for Congress to be able to fully understand the impact and potential unintended consequences of the SEC sweeping new proposals. So here's my question, Secretary. Can you speak to the importance of market liquidity during times of massive economic uncertainty? Well, certainly um, having liquid, liquid markets is um, extremely important to businesses and consumers to be able to um, engage in financial and hedging transactions that they count on to deal with risk. So I, I certainly agree with um, the idea that that should be and is an important priority. And I realize you're not uh, on the SEC, but the current approach, I worry, could rattle markets by rolling out extensive proposals during a time when strong capital markets are just essential to our constituents, economic growth, and national security. Second question, Secretary. News reports suggest the administration is preparing to impose a new round of sanctions on Russia following recent atrocities, including two of Russia's largest financial institutions. The European Union is also said to be preparing new sanctions. In your discussions with your international counterparts, could you speak to the urgency in which the EU plans to intensify Russian sanctions, particularly focusing on a ban on Russian coal, oil, and natural gas exports? Um, I think the, our partners are outraged by the atrocities that are being committed in Russia as we are, and we are working very actively with them to impose new san sanctions that will cause Russia significant pain. This morning, um, we announced our own sanctions package that will now fully block Russia's largest bank, Spare Bank, um, from participating in the U.S. financial system, as well as their largest private bank, Alpha Bank. Um, the president will uh, sign a new executive order prohibiting um, new investment in Russia by all U.S. persons and additional sanctions have been placed on elites and some state-owned enterprises. And Europe is also working at a rapid pace to announce additional sanctions. I, I'm not going to try to tell you exactly what they are, but um, they certainly intend to add to the sanctions they have in place. Absolutely, Secretary. But you don't see a reluctance on their part to target Russian energy exports do you, or change in that reluctance? Um, they recognize clearly the importance of um, depriving Russia of export revenue to the maximum extent that they possibly can, but regrettably have dependence on oil and natural gas. So there are trade-offs there that they're trying to manage as best they can. With that, Madam Chair, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green, who is also the chair of the Subcommittee on Oversight and Investigations, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. And Madam Secretary, uh, thank you very much for all of the many things that you are trying to accomplish and the good things that you've done. <clears throat> I also want to acknowledge the leadership of the president, Madam Secretary. Uh, he has, in my opinion, brought the world together, for the most part, to take on the invasion of Ukraine. And I think that's a significant accomplishment. I still have faith in the president, and I compliment him for his, not only, his ability to not only pull people together, but to try to maintain this coalition so that if this becomes a long-term endeavor, we will still have allies with us. I think that's important. Now, Madam Secretary, I have a copy of your statement uh, for the record, the 
and it indicates as long as the pandemic is raging anywhere in the world, the American people will still be vulnerable to new variants. I believe this to be a truthful statement and correct. As you know, Hong Kong is having some uh, concerns with the virus that are causing great lockdowns, millions of people involved. And as you also know, the Senate had a bill, a deal for $10 billion. Um, that $10 billion deal appears to be stalled. I see where you have uh, encouraged the World Bank to continue working closely with COVAX and the international partners to improve vaccine readiness and to support increased vaccine delivery to developing countries. Have you weighed in with the Senate, Madam Secretary? This is pretty important for us to get this deal done. Uh, would you kindly give a response? Well, my colleagues in the White House have uh, definitely weighed in. They regard um, the provision of additional funding uh, to deal with the pandemic to be a, a critical priority and are very concerned that um, we, we lack the funds that we need to address uh, COVID. So um, they are very focused on this and have weighed in fully um, on the importance of this legislation. Just a follow up, I, I do appreciate weighing in. This is not only about the United States, it's about the world. As you know, the deal uh, is void of emoluments for the rest of the world, just the United States. And now that is being held up. Yes. Uh, I think we, as we weigh in, and I'm sure you're doing this, expand it to make sure we include the rest of the world. I appreciate the $10 billion deal, but your statement rings true. Um, as long as the pandemic is raging anywhere in the world, the American people will still be vulnerable to new variants. Uh, that's important. Uh, so can you give me the, the criticality associated with not only having a deal for the United States, but also the rest of the world? Well, we absolutely need additional funding to help the rest of the world deal with the pandemic as well. We're continuing to do everything that we can through the WHO, the World Bank, the task force that they've put together. And I think that that's right. I would, um, I would repeat what the words that you um, quoted me as saying, that as long as the pandemic is raging in any part of the world, the United States is not safe, there will be new variants. And I think it's critically important. I'd also like to add that um, we have requested funding or the ability to um, lend funds to the new Resilience and Sustainability Trust um, that the IMF is establishing. One of the purposes of that trust is to provide the resources for countries around the world, middle and lower income countries, to be prepared for the next pandemic. I wish we could feel that this will be our last, but we should have learned our lessons that the globe needs to be prepared. And I would ask again that Congress provide um, the authorization that we need to lend resources to the IMF to help them prepare the world for future pandemics. Thank you, Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman from Florida, Mr. Posey, is now recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairwoman Waters. Secretary Yellen, uh, do you believe cutting the deficit spending and borrowing Federal Reserve could make a significant contribution to reducing inflationary pressures? I apologize, I didn't catch your question. Could you say it again? Certainly. Uh, do you believe cutting the deficit spending and borrowing from the Federal Reserve uh, could make a significant contribution to the reduction of inflationary pressures? Did the, what about the Federal Reserve? Did 
something about the Federal Reserve. Can you, could you repeat that? Yes. <laughs> Do you believe cutting deficit spending, got it? Cutting deficit and spending? Mr. Posey, and, would you speak and, into the microphone uh, and yeah, speak up a little good. bit louder? Yeah, I think I got it at 100% here. Let me try it again. Okay. <laughs> Can you believe that uh, cutting deficit spending and borrowing from the Federal Reserve could make a significant contribution to the reduction of inflationary pressures? Um, the Federal Reserve is um, charged with controlling inflation and is taking steps um, to address the inflationary situation here. And um, the administration has just proposed a budget that uh, has over the next decade a trillion dollars worth of deficit reduction. So um, I agree on the importance of controlling inflation and the Fed, of course, is independent in making its judgment judgments on what's appropriate, but um, will uh, take action to uh, help bring inflation down. So you do believe that cutting deficit spending and borrowing from the Federal Reserve uh, could make a contribution to reducing inflationary pressures? I, I think the Fed has a role to play in reducing inflationary pressures, yes. And you think De cutting deficit spending can help? Um, we have proposed to do, to do so in the budget, uh, the fiscal 23 budget that the administration has um, just released. So I take it that's a yes then? Uh, the simple answer is it would be a yes? Yes, and we, we do have a substantial reduction in deficits this year, the deficit. Um, is coming way is coming way down this year. Uh, taxing un, unrealized capital gains uh, would in, increase the present value of taxes on long-term gains. Obviously, um, how will taxing unrealized capital gains impact the size of investment and the allocation of capital among alternative investments? Generally, tax policy, interest rates, all affect the cost of capital, and that is. Um, one factor that influences investment, but um, although in principle the cost of capital should be an important determinant in, of investment spending, most uh, experience in empirical research suggests that the linkages are not terribly strong. Um, usually expected right, future that, output is more important. <laughs> The, the Ukraine war is teaching us again that energy is a strategic as well as an economic good. Uh, in light of that, uh, should we recalibrate the rush to transform the energy economy and increase the contribution of fossil fuels in the short to medium term, say the next 10 to 15 years? I'm sorry, you asked about fossil fuels and what should we do about fossil fuels? Yeah, uh, yeah you know, I think you think we should, you think we should uh, think about recalibrating the rush to, to transform the economy by eliminating them? Well, over, over time to deal with climate change, um, we need to reduce our dependence on fossil fuels. And I think our energy security um, also will be greatly yes, enhanced as we transition to um, renewables. I think really the only uh, way do, you think to, we should, do, you, do you think we should maybe delay the rush a little bit in, in, the, in the current times that we're in, you know, with uh, <laughs> the, energy the, being such an important force in, in the Ukraine right now? Well, the president has proposed um, using uh, reserves from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve and um, incenting producers to raise American producers to raise oil production to deal with the short-run crisis we <coughs> face. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Cleaver, who is also the chair of the Subcommittee on Housing, Community Development, and Insurance, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, and uh, the ranking member, McHenry, uh, for this hearing. And Madam Secretary, thank you uh, very kindly for uh, your always candid uh, comments. Um, 
you know, this, this reckless and ruthless Russian invasion of the Ukraine has uh, laid bare uh, a, a number of things. Um, one of them is, um, at least for me and I think uh, and millions of, of other Americans, uh, th that we need to desperately move toward uh, creating our own sources uh, of energy, at least as, as many of them as we can, uh, solar or fossil or biofuels, whatever, whatever, cellulosic, uh, whatever we, we can do. Um, and um, I, I even though I represent uh, Kansas City, Missouri, I represent one half of it. And then I represent little, little towns like Malty Bend, uh, that people haven't heard of, or, or, or Oric. And one of the things that, that they are talking about is the, the increase in the cost of fertilizer. I mean, most Americans would, would not even remotely consider. But uh, they're talking about the, the, the rise in the cost of fertilizer. <clears throat> uh, and and the, the fertilizer, at least 20% of it, I think, uh, or maybe somewhere in that number, uh, comes out of Belarus and, and uh, Russia. Uh, we've got some, I mean, they, 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 they're having an impact on us right now. And so I, I'm wondering... Uh, I know you, that there are things that Treasury is doing with the uh, uh, IMF uh, and uh, World Bank and International, International Financial uh, Institutions, uh, IFI. Um, are there more things that Treasury can, uh, can do uh, to push us uh, toward a more sustainable nation uh, in, in terms of, of, of energy, at, at least? Um, I'm, I'm concerned that, you know, our politics here in Washington may prevent us from really looking at uh, the fact that there is a global existential threat uh, brought about by, global, by, by climate change. And, uh, and so I, um, I, I guess we'll have to deal with it on, on, on the, the political stage. But are there, are there things that Treasury is doing or would like to do as it relates to this issue. So I share your concern about climate change as an existential threat. I think it it's one that um, demands um, really immediate um, attention. Um, President Biden has proposed a number of policies that Congress hasn't yet passed that would um, increase our reliance on renewables, on wind, on solar, on renewables, and help shift us away from fossil fuels. And I think the current situation in global energy markets and um, the risks that we're experiencing the global economy is due to the, the what's happening in Russia and Ukraine should, if anything, strengthen our resolve to address energy security, um, to rid ourselves of dependence on a global, a global oil market where um, dictators in, in many places really control um, the price and availability of um, our energy supplies. And I think moving to um, away from fossil fuels and toward renewables um, is critical for our energy security as well as for addressing climate change. So both things should be pushing us heavily in that direction. And I hope that Congress will soon act to um, you know, put in place uh, tax incentives for renewables, for electric vehicles, and other aspects of the climate agenda. Thank you very kindly for your vision. Madam Chair, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. The gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Luca Meyer, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, Secretary Yellen, nice to see you this morning, and I appreciate your being here. Um, as you know, I'm the ranking member on small business, and it's disappointing that we're now at 345 days since you have failed to do your statutory duty by showing up there. 
Just a quick question. Do you intend to show up at all at the Small Business Committee to do your job of reporting on the PPP program? Your mic. Microphone, microphone, please. Microphone. microphone. Madam Sorry, Chair, I respect, I respect your comment, but let's be honest here. You're required to be in front of the small business, and you're not there. You're here this morning. Thankfully, that's fine. You go to other committee hearings, but you never show up at that one. I was surprised that the, the chairman of the committee, Ms. Velasquez, didn't ask you this question because it's very plain in the law. It says you show up, and you haven't done it. So my question is, do you intend to show up? Well, I'll, I'll have my staff work with yours to discuss it. That would be fantastic. Thank you. I think it's a repeat of the last question or time we've talked about this, but at least it's a commitment to do something. Um, with regards to the subject we have in front of us this morning, I want to ask you the same question that I asked Chairman Powell the other day, which was, I think this is a very instructive moment from the standpoint that um, I'm, I'm thankful and agree with a lot of the sanctions that you're putting on uh, the, the, the Russian economy, the oligarchs, uh, uh, all the other things you're doing. I don't disagree with those things. I think we both do that and more. Uh, my concern was, or is, that it got done late. We should have had this done in, in uh, instead of being reactive, we should have been proactive. And we knew that the Russians were building three hospitals on the Russian on the Ukrainian border. We knew they were going in, and yet we did nothing until after the fact. So my comment to you, my question to you this morning is, knowing that this was going to happen, we did nothing. We now, I think the ranking member made a comment this morning about China, knowing that they're going to go in. In fact, there's a published report in the, in the newspapers last week that said that China was going to go into Taiwan this fall and decided not to do it. I don't know whether that report is true or not, but it was in the, in the paper, so therefore I think we need to take it seriously. And if that's the case, are, is administration, are you working with the administration, are you putting plans in place as a Treasury Secretary to well, come look, with some deterrence with sanctions right now before they get in there and not wait till after they uh, invade Taiwan? Well, look, you know, we told Russia that we would impose very heavy costs on it if it invaded Ukraine. And the purpose point, was to my... deter that action. Um, you wouldn't deter the action by putting in place sanctions before yes, you can, Madam Chair, something all respect, had occurred. You can do that. When they, when, they put the, when they built the hospitals on the border, you said, that's, that's, a, in, that's an incendiary action on your part. Therefore, we're going to do this. If you, do, if you build another one, we're going to do this. If you build another one, we're going to do that. If you invade, we're going to do this. That can be done. There is a way to deter that if it's structured correctly. And my question is, are you thinking about doing this with China? Yes or no? We, we are certainly um, working together um, in the administration to have in place okay. a wide range of tools and strategies. Okay. Um, with regards to other actions that are going on right now, um, Madam Chair, I'm very concerned about uh, a speech that was made recently by one of the members of your FSOC. Uh, do you think it's financially? Uh, do you think financial stability of the United States would be threatened if roughly a quarter of the deposits of the United States were not insured by the FDIC? Do you think it will hurt the financial stability of our country? If 25% of the bank deposits in this country were not were not insured by the FDIC, so I'm not sure what you're referring to, but I would certainly say that <coughs> deposit insurance has played a critical role okay. in um, making <coughs> runs. You, you, I'm sure you very would agree. I'm sure, I'm sure you would agree that this is this is extremely important. The FDIC insurance underpins the stability of our of our banking economy. If Mr. Style could just please stand and sit still so I could see the chairman, it'd be great. Thank you. <laughs> Apologize. Um, because what happened was Mr. Chopra, and I have his speech right here, made a speech last week in which he um, made a comment that he thought it was okay to limit access. One of the, one of the punitive actions he took or suggested as a result of, of continued violations by bankers and, and big banks especially uh, was to limit access to deposit insurance and put banks directly into receivership. Don't take my remarks wrong here. I think if these guys are doing bad things, they need to be punished, they need to be fined, thrown in jail. I don't care. But what you're doing when you undermine the financial system by saying pulling FDIC insurance, you're hurting, you're hurting the consumers, the customers of those banks, and this is a gentleman who is intended or should be worried about consumers. I would hope that you'd be concerned about that. Gentleman's time has expired. The gentlewoman from Ohio, Mrs. Beatty, who is also the chair of the subcommittee on diversity 
and inclusion is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam uh, Chairwoman Waters. And today I'd like to also thank Secretary Yellen for appearing before the committee uh, today. Uh, I truly appreciate your leadership as Treasury implements the sanctions against Putin's regime, particularly those uh, as more details of war crimes and atrocities committed in the Ukraine come to light. Uh, my question, Madam Secretary, is uh, I first let me say I welcome your testimony that the international financial institutions will be providing support to refugees uh, to the countries that are welcoming refugees. And this is something that I've been, I've been concerned about since the very beginning of the humanitarian crises. As you may know, last month when this committee marked up legislation related to the Ukraine crises and Russian sanctions, I was pleased to have a bipartisan provision added that will address the United States, well, really you, in your capacity as secretary to use our position on the IFIs to encourage economic support for refugees, including those of African descent who have been uh, faced with particular hardship. So can you tell me how will the financing uh, made available by the IFIs be used to aid refugees? And how can we assure that these funds are being distributed equitably? Well, I, I think that the international financial institutions have a critically important role in helping refugees and helping countries that are hosting refugees. Um, and, you know, the we will have meetings of uh, the international financial institutions, the IMF and World Bank, a week after next, and will be uh, involved in active discussions with them about how to fashion programs uh, to make sure that aid is distributed um, effectively. Um, bilaterally, we will also be involved in that, and uh, the European Union will as well. Um, thank you. I'm going to try to get in two more uh, questions, but while I have you, uh, let me quickly follow up on something that you and I have talked with, and let me just say uh, up front, your staff has worked extremely well with my team in putting Harriet Tubman in her rightful place on the $20 note. Um, but I'm, I guess I have a, a concern, and while I'm thankful for your engagement, I'm not pleased with the timeline that's left out. I realize you inherited uh, a lot. I, I know before we had been working with your predecessor during the Obama administration, and we thought we had great, made great headways. And I understand the, the technical limitations for the security features, the production capacity, and all of that. But I really don't see any reason why the concept and design steps couldn't be moved much faster. Uh, getting the design free stage would mean a lot to the people who have been working on this and waiting on this uh, for far too long and too many years. I know this is a problem that you inherited, uh, but the delays made by your predecessor, and I would ask for a commitment for you to move this process along. And I, I guess that I, I want to hear today if we could take maybe the part that shows her imaging. We have a piece of legislation, bipartisan, with overwhelming, and I'm going to push it to get to the 200 to sign on this, that we can lock in that stage of the image. If you could take a few seconds and respond. Well, what I can say is I promise for my own part to do everything I possibly can to expedite this process. And um, I know that there was no action on it during the previous administration. Um, we're still adhering to the original timeline that was announced. I'm trying to remember when it was first announced. Maybe it was 20, 2014, if I'm not mistaken. It's, you are, it's you a, are correct. It's a frustratingly time-consuming process, and um, it involves developing um, technologically sophisticated 
security features, new security features, a generation of them. And I hate to cut you off, but my time is going to expire. So I, I do want to show that we have an image. And we're going to do legislation to lock in this image and you to support us in that. Thank you in my time. Thank you. The Goodbye. gentlelady's time has expired. The gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Heisinger, is now recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and uh, Secretary Yellen. Good to have you back here in person and to see you again. I'm very, very briefly. Don't filibuster me on this one, please. Uh, but last time you appeared here with uh, with uh, Chair uh, Powell, you had uh, claimed you felt inflation was at that point transitory. Do you still believe that today? So, um... very short, please. I think when I used the word transitory, I was thinking that it's related to the pandemic and that when the pandemic goes away, that will make a big difference. Do you still, still believe, believe it's transitory? That. I believe that the pandemic, unfortunately, has been and will be longer lasting okay. than I anticipated. So you still, basically you're saying the pandemic is still happening, therefore we're, that's why we're still seeing inflation. Well, I think that's one of the contributors okay. to it. Okay. Um, all right. So let me let me get into the meat of what we need to talk about here about what's happening on on uh, in, in international uh, situations. Um, I am pleased, and Madam Chair, thank you for uh, including my legislation and 16 bills that were actually noticed uh, for this uh, for this hearing today. And I had a bill, uh, the Russian Sovereign Debt Prohibition Act, which was noticed. And uh, this bill would simply prohibit U.S. financial institutions from financing Russian sovereign debt, regardless of the date a bond was issued, uh, extending the Biden administration's current restrictions on new bonds that are being issued. Um, and uh, I know that it was supposed to be considered in the March uh, markup. Something happened and somehow it fell off. Uh, we have a committee, I think, uh, are trying to do everything we can to tighten those restrictions. And uh, I respectfully ask that the chairwoman include that legislation in the next package of bills that we might uh, consider. Yesterday, I reintroduced another bill uh, that I had had previously called the No U.S. Financing for Iran Act, uh, a bill that would effectively prevent U.S. financial institutions from engaging with the government of Iran while prohibiting both the IMF and the Export-Import Bank from providing them financing. Specifically, my bill would prohibit the exchange of special drawing rights, and it's similar to what uh, my colleague, Mr. Hill, has worked on regarding uh, Russia. Uh, Secretary Yellen, can you certify that the Biden administration will oppose the exchange of uh, Iran, Iran's SDRs, those special drawing rights, with any country, even if the administration concludes a new nuclear agreement with Tehran? Well, Iran has not been able to use its special drawing rights the United States would not exchange um, SDRs for dollars, um, nor have our partners, and um, I don't so you, see that changing. You commit, okay, so you commit so, to continuing I, that. Well, we'll we'll have to see what happens if they sign a bill. But I have no. Well, that's a, that's a different. Sign. That's a different answer than we have no intention to. We have. There's no change in U.S. policy. We have. Um, not been willing to in any way aid Iran in using its SDRs, and I don't envision that changing. Okay. Um, well, in Washington Post, uh, had an article uh, over the weekend um, saying that Tehran has demanded that we lift the Iranian Revolutionary Guard uh, Corps' designation as a foreign terrorist organization. Uh, that same article quoted a high-ranking Iranian official who said effectively, an agreement to revive the nuclear deal with the U.S. is close. Um, do you think that's a fair assessment, first of all? And, uh, and, and as you know, President Trump had, had put in that, uh, that original uh, designation back in 2019. It's still heavily, heavily uh, sanctioned, um, and there has been some enforcement actions uh, but there's also been some sanctions that designations that have been lifted. Does the Biden administration uh, continue to believe that the Revolutionary Guard is a foreign terrorist organization? They are designated as such. There are active negotiations taking place over the JCPOA, but I'm, I can't comment on the details of can't what's or happening won't. in those. I, I don't believe I can or should. Okay, so you may have that knowledge but you're not able to share it. 
um, I am not deeply involved in the details of those negotiations. All right. Have, have you or anyone else at Treasury been directed to reduce Iran, uh, Iranian sanctions enforcement so as to not interfere with those Vienna talks? We haven't changed our sanctions. That's not my Iran. question. That's not my question. Have you, uh, have you been instructed to or requested to? You may have ignored it. I'm just, I guess that's what I'm trying to find out. There's been no change in any administration policy to the best of my knowledge. And I'll follow up with some written uh, uh, questions as well. I appreciate that. The gentleman that. from back. California, Mr. Vargas, is now recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair, for this hearing. And uh, especially, I want to thank the Secretary for being here. I appreciate it. Uh, Madam Secretary, it sounded like, uh, and, I, and I want to apologize, I wasn't here for the whole meeting. I have another hearing that's running at the same time that happens around here quite a bit, as you know. But um, it sounded like someone was trying to put words in your mouth about the issue of inflation being transitory or related to the pandemic. Could you say a little bit more about that? Because I think a lot of people are starting to forget that we're in a pandemic and so much of this inflation is tied to that. Um, could you comment on that, please? Yes, certainly. So um, in part, the inflation represents the impact of supply bottlenecks. Um, for example, a third of the inflation we've had reflects higher prices of new and used cars. And um, unfortunately, the auto companies are unable to um, get sufficient semiconductors to produce cars at uh, capacity. So inventories are highly depleted. Cars, both new and used, are in tremendous demand, and their prices have risen. But also, we've had um, enormous demand for goods, for imports, particularly coming from East Asia, um, that have resulted in higher shipping costs, higher trucking costs. Um, these these disturbances, these inflationary developments are pandemic related because um, we saw enormous shifts away from services and towards goods during the pandemic. Um, a huge increase in the demand for durable goods that strained the capacity of the US and global economies to um, meet those demands um, in a timely fashion. And, um, and, and that's what I mean in part by being pandemic related. So um, we, we do have a very tight labor market. Um, core inflation is also um, quite high. Um, addressing the pandemic, I believe, will help. The Federal Reserve also has a job to do with respect to inflation. So, Madam Secretary, I'm a, I'm a car guy. I collect cars, and I pay attention to the prices of cars. I normally collect old ones, not new ones. But the truth of the matter is you normally don't pay MSRP for a new car. You normally pay below that. That's what you negotiate. But a lot of these cars have been selling above MSRP. And that's, again, it's because of the same issue. It's the pandemic. I mean, I think that's what you were saying in layman's terms. I mean, you weren't saying it in layman's terms, but I say it in layman's terms. That's why cars are so damn expensive. Sure. I mean, inventories of cars are depleted because um, the American car companies aren't able to produce at their capacity. They just can't get the semiconductors that they need to embody into these cars. And that's because the demand for goods and for technology, um, his uh, technology devices that uh, incorporate semiconductors uh, became so enormous during the pandemic it, it takes a long time to increase semiconductor manufacturing capacity. Um, American companies are in the process of doing it, but at the moment, I think if you go to a, a, a car lot and try to a dealership, you, you see almost no inventory available to purchase, and that's why you pay more than MSRP. That's right, and uh, now I do want to put some words in your mouth. I believe they are your words. 
And I think you were saying the war in Ukraine threatens to inflict, and I think this is what you said, enormous economic repercussions. Again, you may have commented already, but I have 30 seconds left. Could you comment on that? Sure. Uh, the, the sanctions that we've placed on Russia are pushing up the price of energy. We think it's a price that's important to pay to punish Russia for what it's doing in Ukraine, but energy prices are going up, the price of wheat and corn that uh, Russia and Ukraine produce are going up, and um, metals that um, play an important industrial role, nickel, titanium, palladium that goes into catalytic converters, the costs of those things are going up, fertilizer, potash, and this is going to escalate inflationary pressures as well. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Barr, is now recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Secretary Yellen, for your testimony right here. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, let me follow up uh, with uh, Ranking Member McHenry's line of questioning about the energy loophole in the sanctions on Russian banks. And I've talked to Deputy uh, Secretary Adeyemo about this, and he's a very impressive guy, and he's open-minded to my line of inquiry. I hope you are as well. I have a bill called the No Energy Revenues for Russian Hostilities Act that would close that loophole or give the administration the option to create an escrow arrangement that requires all Russian energy revenues to be allocated uh, for humanitarian purposes, which is similar to arrangements currently in place with Iran. So to the extent that you have concerns or the administration has diplomatic concerns or sensitivities with respect to our European allies' uh, over-dependence on Russian gas, this legislation or this approach would enable you to retain the ability to waive or license specific transactions to help our European allies uh, get those uh, supplies of gas, but then escrow the proceeds of those transactions and have a carrot approach, not just a stick, but a carrot approach, build up those revenues and uh, pr say to Putin, withdraw. You get your uh, gas revenues, but only if you withdraw from Ukraine and only if you use these proceeds for humanitarian purposes. Would you be open to that approach? I, I think something along those lines is a constructive suggestion, and I think it's an approach that is worth exploring. Um, we've made it, we have a way uh, for Russia to sell oil and gain the proceeds in the form of a general license, but the license is temporary, it ex will expire. We need, we need a, probably a better mechanism, and I think it's a, constructive suggestion well, thank that you. And, and, we can work with thank you Thank you. And your deputy, uh, 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 Mr. Adeyemo, was open to that as well. I'd appreciate you all looking at that. Again, it's, it's a bill that I have, No Energy Revenues for Russian Hostilities Act. Uh, I think this is the loophole that we need to close. Uh, this is what Zelensky is asking for. When he says we need to be tougher on sanctions, this is what he's talking, this is, this is what is financing Putin's war. It is the is the the foreign currency that is that is uh, that is being used through these energy transactions. This is what we need to to cut off uh, to the extent we can. I, I would I would just emphasize that we need the flexibility to work with our partners on this. This um, coalition has been critical to our I agree. success. I we I agree, to be Secretary. Not to, be unilateral I in agree. our approach. I agree, and I know, and I, I, I agree with that. Um, but this bill and this approach would give us that flexibility. It would enable you to, to provide some of those transactions, uh, allow some of those transactions to go through for our European partners, uh, but build those proceeds up in an in a, in a escrow account and give an incentive for Putin to withdraw. Let me ask you another question, changing, uh, switching gears here. Uh, as someone who served both as chair of the Federal Reserve and now in your capacity as Treasury Secretary, the chair of FSOC, you have a unique view into the regulatory landscape for the financial services industry. And one of the things that I've always wanted to learn more about is how our regulators develop frameworks with international standard-setting bo bodies. Decisions made at Basel and the FSB are highly impactful 
to the U.S. economy, and I don't feel like Congress really has any insight or visibility into what the United States advocates for in these negotiations. What types of materials and briefings were you given as Fed chair and now as FSOC chair with respect to what we commit to in these groups? What types of materials can we get for this committee to ensure that the advocacy is in line with the policy goals of the Congress? Well, we can try to provide you with materials and briefings. Um, the, the FSB and the BIS publish their work papers um, on their websites. Um, the, there's no regulatory enforcement through those agencies there. Um, these are fora in which we discuss um, with partners around the world what would be desirable regulations, but it doesn't in any way inhibit what we can do or compel us to do anything in the United States. We do what's in our interest, but it's a way to try to have a global system that's coordinated and coherent. Thank you, Secretary. Yield back. Thank you. The gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Foster, who is also the chair of the task force on artificial intelligence, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair and Secretary Yellen. Um, Secretary Yellen, I understand that you will be giving a speech tomorrow regarding digital asset regulation. I don't want to force you to reveal any spoilers here. Um, I do want to touch on something that I believe is just at the core of developing any well-regulated digital asset ecosystem and that is how can participants securely and reliably assert their digital identity online and offline with the appropriate controlled anonymity that is uh, being developed in the EU and elsewhere. Um, I was very encouraged that uh, recently Secretary, um, uh, Assistant Secretary for Terrorist Financing and Financial Crimes, Elizabeth Rosenberg, uh, she recently announced that the Treasury planned to make 20 in 2022 quote, a year of action for digital identity. Um, there are really a host of reasons why Treasury may be the most appropriate authority to help deploy a secure digital identity framework. Um, I'm also very encouraged that the technical components for a privacy preserving, crypt, you know, you could call it a crypto financial driver's license are actually in place. Uh, the mobile ID or digital driver's license that are being rolled out by a number of states are based on interoperable standards originally developed at NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, and now being adopted by the International Standards Organization uh, around the world. Um, and they've actually been implemented uh, for both iPhones and Android. Uh, these allow a modern cell phone to be used as a very high quality, privacy preserving, biometric second factor that will be absolutely crucial in combating identity fraud and many other um, online misbehaviors. Uh, your department's work uh, towards combating illicit finance and preventing government benefits fraud, uh, soon as central bank digital currency, would all greatly benefit from an improved and internationally operable digital identity framework. Uh, so can you speak a little bit about how Treasury uh, might be uh, well equipped for such an effort that will really require an extraordinary, extraordinary level of international and interagency cooperation? So I believe this is a very important initiative. I'm not an expert on the details, but I would, would say to you that Treasury has very wide-ranging equities in digital um, identity space, um, in part because we administer public benefits, tax refunds, and because we have a broader role in the financial system. So we absolutely want to explore um, how we can develop and implement um, digital identity solutions that um, will coordinate across the government. And um, we're at this point fleshing out actions that we can take to advance this agenda. If you have specific ideas, we would um, welcome the opportunity to discuss them with you and um, I can have my staff give a briefing on what we're thinking about as well, if that would be useful, but yeah. like to yeah, um, very, have the benefit of your you thinking on this. Yeah, and, and I think that the international uh, 
collaboration will be essential from the start. I mean, if you're really going to have a central bank digital currency and you need a means of authenticating yourself as a, as a legitimate participant for a central bank digital currency, and you want uh, you know, foreign nationals to, uh, you know, to participate in your central bank digital currency, you're going to have to have agreements, at least among the free democracies of the world, as to how this is really going to work. And, and so I, I urge you, uh, it seems very much in line with the Biden administration's push towards getting the free democracies of the world to act coherently to do um, things like preventing you know, corruption, financial fraud. And, and this is at the, you know, is going to be at, really at the heart of this. Um, and uh, let's see, another, can, can you say um, a, a little bit about the, um, the executive order um, related to crypto? That, that's come out and how you see Treasury as participation uh, going the, in that? The executive order related to digital assets. Correct. Yes, I mean, it, it, the president has asked um, the agencies, but tre Treasury plays an important role in um, assessing the future of money, and um, that entails uh, the role of digital assets how we can create an environment in which responsible innovation can flourish, but um, there is adequate protection of consumers, investors, financial stability concerns, um, risks of illicit finance. Um, we need a regulatory framework um, that I think we don't have at this point and want to make recommendations as to how we can safely do this. Also look at the pros and cons of a central bank digital currency. Pardon. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Williams, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. In, uh, in full disclosure, Madam Secretary, I am a car dealer. There's a lot of conversation going on about my industry. I'd love to talk to you one day about it after COVID, what life is after COVID in the car industry. Uh, I also wanted to follow up on Mr. Lukemeyer's question on coming to the Small Business Committee, of which I am also a member. Uh, you seem to not answer the question again, and you said you needed to talk to your staff first. I don't understand we need to talk to your staff to attend a meeting you're required to attend. So are you, can you say you will come see us? Okay. Certainly, All right. We, we okay. Certainly prepared to discuss. All right. It. Thank you. You spent the last few months touting a new international tax uh, regime that you have been negotiating with other large uh, econo economies. And recently, numerous American businesses have raised concerns about some of the details that have started to come to light. Independent experts who have examined the deal found that the U.S. companies are disproportionately negatively impacted. Well, foreign companies. Uh, our competitors, in other words, have negotiated protections for key industries. So lucky for our business community, whatever international agreement you make will ultimately need congressional approval. And you will either need to get the deal classified as a treaty, uh, which would require the approval of 67 senators, or a revenue-generating proposal, which would need to pass both chambers of Congress. So regardless of how the agreement is ultimately classified, you will not be able to follow through on any of your promises without significant buy-in from Congress. And I guarantee you that the support you need to make these drastic changes in international law, tax law do not exist. They are not, you know, they, they're not here in the House or the Senate. So because right now we are hearing from U.S. companies that this deal makes them less competitive. So Madam Secretary, how will you approve your congressional engagement as these negotiations progress? Well, we have been engaged throughout over the last several years in briefing on both sides of the aisle, uh, members of um, the committees um, th ab about the tax agreement and um, have kept people up to date, members of Congress up to date on um, w the um, negotiations that have taken place in the OECD bill. Um, So-called Pillar 2 is really ready for enactment yeah. and a package that would have um, met our commitments was in the House passed um, a reconciliation bill that hasn't progressed in the Senate. But um, we think that the idea that this does, it, 
harms the competitiveness of American businesses. I really have to push yeah. back strongly against this. I think uh, the United States now is the only country in the world that has a minimum uh, global tax. And what this deal does is commit 137 countries around the world mm -hmm. to establishing a global minimum tax, which um, will greatly okay. enhance the competitive yeah. position of our firms that are the only ones that face this now. And yeah. for the globe, it will stop the race to the bottom in terms of countries yeah lowering their tax rates and leaving countries unable to raise the tax revenues right. that businesses need us to have to invest in infrastructure and other yeah. things that will make our yeah. economy competitive. Just a bit of raising taxes is not a winnable position, I don't think, and uh, that's where I stand where a lot of people stand. So last week, the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco released a study that showed inflation spiked last March after the Democrats forced the American Rescue Plan through Congress. They analyzed the current U.S. inflation rate against other developed economies and concluded that upwards of 3% of the inflation we are experiencing can be attributed to government spending. We know how the government spends. So unfortunately, some people in Congress are trying to revive the Build Back Better Act to spend trillions more dollars in a time when the economy is already overheated. They often cite the same economists who incorrectly claimed inflation was transitory. We talked about that today as the ones who now say build back better will reduce inflation. So we cannot double down on the reckless government spending and continue to drive up inflation. Uh, I can tell you as a small business owner, I know what that's doing to our business. So Madam Secretary, I have two part question real quick. First, who is uh, who in this uh, country is hurt the most by the inflation? Uh, that would be my first question. Well, households or consumers are hurt by inflation and low-income consumers probably bear the biggest burden. Okay, my time is up, and I give my time back to Chairman. Thank you very much. The gentleman from California, Mr. Sherman, who is also the chair of the Subcommittee on Investor Protection, Entrepreneurship, and Capital Markets, is now recognized for five minutes. Madam Secretary, uh, at the beginning of this year, we faced uh, $16 trillion of legacy LIBOR, uh, where you, the parties would not know how much uh, interest should be paid by the borrower to the lender. Uh, we've solved that problem. I want to thank you and your staff for your help in, uh, in drafting uh, the, uh, the LIBOR Act. And then I want to thank the other part of your staff for uh, promptly uh, issuing uh, tax regulations to clarify what I think was obvious, but it always deserves clarification when you're dealing with $16 trillion, and that is that there was no sale or exchange as a result of uh, the change in index. Um, the chair of the Small Business uh, uh, Committee uh, brought up in her comments uh, the uh, issue of uh, cryptocurrency and Russians using that to evade uh, our sanctions. I want to commend all members of this committee. The bill I've dropped today, the uh, Russia Digital Assets uh, Sanctions Compliance Act, which would give the administration the authority to tell crypto exchanges that they have to shut down all Russian wallets or some portion of Russian wallets. Um, the crypto exchanges have announced that they're going to do business as usual with all uh, those that they believe are uh, Russian uh, uh, citizens or Russian companies unless and until uh, laws are passed that require them to do otherwise. This is in real contrast to so much of the rest of the private sector, which has voluntarily cut off Russia, particularly their oligarchs and government. The ranking member of the full committee brought up the issue of uh, a possible invasion of Taiwan. I look forward to working with him and others on this committee on a bill that would strip China of its most favored nation status or normal trade relationship with the United States automatically should there be an invasion or blockade of, uh, uh, of Taiwan. Uh, we, of course, focus on Ukraine, and I will in a second, but an even greater disaster is occurring in the world, and that is in the uh, Ethiopian uh, region of uh, Tigray, uh, where 500,000 people have been killed. Uh, this has been done not only by the Ethiopian government, but the government of uh, Eritrea, which have imposed a blockade uh, that threatens to kill hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people. 
Uh, given the short time, I'm going to ask you to respond for the record. What additional sanctions can we oppose, uh, particularly on uh, Eritrea, which has crossed international border for the purpose of engaging in a coordinated genocide against uh, the people of Tigray? Um, it's hard to seize Russian oligarch assets if you don't know who owns what. Um, it, it, Washington Post reported on March uh, 16th that finding yachts and mansions is easier than uncovering money in private equity funds uh, that don't need to uh, uh, comply with the same anti-corruption rules. U.S. private equity hedge funds, venture capitals are not currently required to disclose beneficial ownership information uh, to, of their investors to FinCEN, nor are they required to provide that information to the SEC. In February, the House passed the Competes Act, which included a, an amendment uh, that I authored uh, requiring the issuers of large issuances of exempt securities to file beneficial ownership uh, with the SEC. Um, so uh, a, we do need to know about this $11 trillion of private securities market uh, if we're going to know uh, what's owned by which government agencies in Moscow or which Russian oligarchs. Uh, uh, Chair, uh, Congresswoman um, uh, Maloney's Corporate Transparency Act now requires Treasury to establish a federal beneficial ownership database administered by FinCEN. Madam Secretary, can you give us uh, information on the time frame uh, where we expect uh, this database to be set up? So let me, let me say on the FinCEN, um, we um, are working very hard to establish that database as rapidly as possible and have come out with one of the two proposed rules that we need. It's a very complex undertaking. We want to get it right. I want to um, respond on the issue about private equity firms and hedge funds um, that we're we, we share the concerns um, of members of Congress who have raised this issue, and um, we're actively considering a rule that would address potential gaps in the AML CFT coverage for investment advisors, and do believe that this is something that needs to be addressed. Thank you. It may just have to respond for the record, but we now have a climate counselor uh, in the administration to coordinate a broad range of work regarding uh, uh, climate-related finance, economic, and tax policy. I hope you could provide us with an update on Treasury's updates uh, efforts to coordinate uh, with our international partners. Be happy to. Thank you. Thank you. The gentleman from Arkansas, Mr. Hill, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, Madam Secretary. It's so good to have you back before the committee, and I appreciate my, my colleagues uh, discussing at length uh, the role of the special drawing rights issues that you and I have talked about several times, but I think it does merit uh, noting that the $17.5 billion in equivalent of SDRs that were issued uh, last summer by the IMF to Russia boosted their total SDR balance by the to 72%, meaning that was the largest portion of their SDRs are from last year's allocation. And it's really their gold and their SDRs that in my view are still subject to the ability to avoid uh, sanctions. Uh, I think it's a real risk and that's why I'm also glad that uh, Chair Waters, uh, we marked up HR 6899 uh, that encourages you as our Treasury Secretary to make sure that the US works very hard to make sure that Russia and Belarus cannot in any way exchange uh, uh, their SDRs. So thank you for that, that work. Um, so I want to follow up, though, on our conversation we had last summer. You made some commitments to the committee and to the public about uh, the enhanced rules that the IMF would do about that SDR issuance. Uh, you told us in March last year, we're working with the IMF to craft rules that will make transparency, make it difficult to exchange. Did the IMF release those rules? So the IMF has um, given countries guidelines about um, appropriate use of SDRs, and there is a disclosure framework so that we can monitor how they are being used. I, I, don't, I don't quite know where you can access those, but 
I know that they have been produced. I think it'd be useful for the committee to have uh, that access to those guidelines. And do you know uh, if any uh, SDRs were exchanged uh, since they were issued for payment in any uh, form of debt? Um, so I can't give you a detailed rundown, but I can tell you that the United States... Now, I know the United States isn't doing it. This isn't the question. This is in your capacity of overseeing uh, our role as the largest shareholders in the IMF. I know that the U.S. is in good standing here. But one of the concerns last year was you couldn't obtain that commitment from yeah. anybody. And we didn't ask anybody to commit to it in advance of it being uh, issued. Uh, so we have not seen that guidance. We don't know uh, what those transactions have taken place, if any, over the past year. So I think that would be uh, very helpful. We'll try to work with you on that. Thank you very much. And this is all why I introduced uh, H.R. 1568, the Special Drawing Rights Oversight Act, which uh, would do the following. Would require congressional approval for all allocations of SDRs equal to 25% of the U.S. quota, rather than the 100% under current law, limit unilateral allocations to once every 10 years rather than every five years, and requiring congressional consultations 180 days uh, before consenting to an allocation rather than 90. We don't need to reiterate how much we've, uh, I think, demonstrated that last year's SDR issue across the board to all members of the IMF was a mistake, as noted by Ranking Member uh, McHenry. Um, on the subject of FinCEN, do you believe that FinCEN should have the nationwide authority to review any transaction of any amount on any subject out in the financial space over $10,000? In other words, expand the geographic targeting that they do to a nationwide audience. Do you think that's appropriate? So I'm, I'm not sure. I need to get back to you on that. I know that FinCEN has some concerns with geographic coverage um, because of the prevalence of internet transactions and um, would like to see some changes. I'd like to, to, I'd like to hear your I'd like to hear your personal view on that because with no limitations, that would mean every transaction over ten thousand dollars would be subject to review by a FinCEN staff and added to a database. That seems unusual to me and perhaps not prudent, so I'd like your personal view on that. Uh, last subject I wanted to raise with you is uh, we've all expressed some concerns, including the chairwoman, about uh, the performance of our managing director at the IMF, uh, Kristalina Gaya, uh, uh, Ger 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 Gaylor Gaya. Um, and I have uh, concerns about her qualifications. Do you share those concerns? Do you have all the faith in the world in her leadership at the IMF? Um, believe that she's done a good job of guiding the IMF. Um, there, we have um, been very supportive of the work that the World Bank did to um, look into um, the um, World Bank's doing business report. Um, Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm, I'm going to uh, send uh, to our Oversight Committee, Madam Chair, a uh, letter requesting an, an investigation to the uh, Director of the IMF. Thank you. Well, without objection, such is the order. Thank you. Uh, we will now hear from uh, the, the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Perlmutter. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Madam Secretary, good to see you. Thank you. Um, I want to give you the state of play of safe banking, which is the cannabis and banking. And you and I have had many conversations about this. But I want you to understand where it is and to put the muscle of the administration uh, behind getting it passed. So uh, we've passed it now out of the House six times. Uh, most recently, it was amended onto the America Competes Act. Uh, the way we've passed it has been with sizable uh, bipartisan majorities. Uh, when it was a standalone, we passed it 321 to 101. But it seems to get. Got somebody up above me, so I might be next, but I got four minutes. Hey, Al, you need to mute. I usually suggest maybe doing something like a buffet. Um, so gets to the Senate and gets stuck. And when Senator Crapo chaired the committee, uh, you know, basically from the Republicans' point of view, too big, too broad, 
Uh, now Senator Brown is the chair of the committee, too limited, too narrow. But we know that people are still getting killed and robbed. And most recently, Seattle Times did an editorial last week because three people were killed in Seattle last week. A robber, a police officer, and an owner of a dispensary because of all the cash. Uh, Oakland, California, in uh, November, there were 25 armed robberies in one week. And we had a young woman uh, speak with us who was one of those who was robbed. And then she got robbed again last week. Small businesses, minority-owned businesses need access to capital, which they would get if the banking system were open to them. So I just, I, I was speaking to the National Bank Supervisors uh, last week, and I said to them, you know, this isn't Ukraine. This issue isn't Ukraine. This issue isn't nuclear winter. This issue isn't climate change, but it's a real problem. And they said, yeah, you're sent there to solve problems and they expect this problem to be solved. I'd like to just get your sentiment on this subject since you and I have talked about it for a very long time. We, we have talked about it for a very long time and I agree with you, it's an important issue and it's extremely frustrating one that we haven't been able to resolve it. I really appreciate your leadership in this area. We have worked with you on this bill. We are supportive of it. As you know, there is a conflict between state and national law. Banks are trapped in the middle of that, and um, some legislative solution, I think, is necessary to um, move this forward. Um, I, I share your frustration that um, we haven't been able to make progress. I think it does really require congressional congressional action. Well, and I thank you for that, and I guess I just ask you to impress upon the administration the need to either get it passed as part of the American Competes Act, uh, which I think will be coming up the quickest, so that nobody else dies because there's so much cash, or stand alone, but get it out of the Senate and get it to the president. So I, We would like to see that happen. Thank you very much. I'll, uh, I will switch to Ukraine now for a second. Um, you know, one of the things that we've seen, um, President Biden's brought together all sorts of nations uh, to deal with uh, sanctions on Russia and to, in response to the invasion. But however, Russia's been preparing for this moment for some time, and Putin has been attempting to sanction-proof his economy. What should we make of the Russian ruble's recovery from the freefall it saw in early March? And is this a sign that the Russian economy is more resilient than we originally thought? The Russian economy is really reeling from the sanctions that we put in place. And the market um, in rubles is not a free market where the value that's established in trading reflects the value it, the currency would have um, if it could be freely traded. Um, Russians aren't allowed to sell assets. Foreigners who own Russian assets are not allowed to sell rubles and take their money from the country. There are capital controls in place and um, the restrictions that the, that Russia and the Russian Central Bank have put on Russians leads to a situation in which you shouldn't really infer anything from the value of the currency. Thank, and thank you for your service, and my time has expired. Thank you very much. The gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Laudermilk, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Madam Secretary, for being here today. Um, I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about the implementation of the anti-money laundering and beneficial own ownership uh, reform law that uh, I know that you're working on right now. And uh, the new rules from FinCEN really will require regular reporting of beneficial ownership from about 30 million businesses, along with about 2 million new businesses per year. <clears throat> Now, the vast majority of these businesses, <coughs> excuse me, are law-abiding, and 
their focus is on serving their customers, making payroll, um, their law-abiding businesses, but they don't stay tuned in to what's going on here on Capitol Hill. They're not watching the C-SPAN coverage of this today. They're just there trying to make a living. And so I see that it's going to be a real challenge uh, to make sure they're aware of these new rules. Now, we don't want this to become a gotcha enforcement mechanism that's used by, unfortunately, too many agencies now as, as punishment for someone who just isn't aware that they have to give up this type of information. And, and quite frankly, most of them are, are small businesses. So my question is, what's your plan to work with state governments to make sure that small businesses are aware of the requirements and, and so they'll know how they, they have to comply? Well, I think you, you raised an important point that it is, it is important to be in touch with these businesses. Um, I can't tell you in detail what the plan is, but um, I'd be glad to have people at Treasury um, discuss this with you and um, offer a briefing and um, have a chance to hear your concerns and suggestions. Well, I think it's going to be imperative for us to have a plan going in because, uh, you know, we, as I said, it, it doesn't, it should not turn into a gotcha enforcement mechanism to where a guy that runs a, a small carpentry shop who is more focused on the price he's paying for lumber and sheetrock, et cetera, he's trying to keep his businesses going, all of a sudden gets a knock on the door from a federal agent that says, you've never told us who you are and your ownership. I don't believe that is, I hope that isn't the direction that we're going, but I don't know, I think there needs to be a plan going forward and that Congress is aware of the plan, the plan of how we are going to let these businesses know of the requirements that, that have been put on them by Congress and by the federal government to, uh, to, to comply with this new law. And so I think there definitely uh, should be a plan moving forward because this is, uh, most of these businesses, they don't have floors of compliance lawyers. They don't even have a lawyer. You know, they're just trying to get by. So I, I also think that the, there's a concern with many of us that the pr proposed rules definitions of substantial control and ownership interests are overly complicated. Uh, I think this is, uh, it's gonna make it hard to apply them consistently across the board, especially with various size businesses. And it's gonna compound the problem for banks and credit unions if FinCEN uses those same definitions in an updated customer due diligence rule. So. As a follow-on question, will Treasury and FinCEN take steps to try to simplify, simplify these aspects of the rule before it's finalized? So, you know, it, FinCEN has put out a proposed rule to collect the information, and it does wish to minimize the burden on entities that are required to report it. Um, so there have been very significant public comments on the rule and uh, FinCEN will consider them very carefully, um, you know, before trying to finalize a rule in this area. So, so this is a legitimate, a very legitimate concern and one that FinCEN needs to right. carefully and, and work on. And if I'm not mistaken, FinCEN is technically a part of the Department of Treasury, is that correct? Yes. Of which you are at the yes. captain of the helm. So. I mean, it, it sounds a little bit like you're deferring that it, them to be an independent agency over here, but they do answer to you, is that correct? That's correct. It's and so what I'm asking is, are you going to give direction in these areas to simplify substantial uh, control and ownership interest or, or you know, uh, make it such that this doesn't turn into an issue where we find potentially millions of businesses not in compliance with the law and, and wondering where they're gonna go. I mean, I'm looking for some type of direction. I'm, I'm not hearing there's a plan and I'm not hearing that this is the way we're going, just kind of hoping that's the way we go. Well, I agree that you. this is a very legitimate concern that needs to be addressed and we will address it. All right, thank you. Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Lawson, is now recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thanks uh, for having uh, this, this hearing. Secretary Yellen, I'm hearing from some small uh, uh, 
see DFIs, that they are concerned that proposed changes being made by the CFDI's fund will make it harder to become certified as a, CD, a CDFI and access the important capital that Congress has been providing. This is especially troubling coming out of a pandemic. Can I get a commitment from you today that we will look into this and make sure that the administration and the CFDI's funds will not make changes to the certification process for community institutions to become CDFIs more difficult? So um, we'd be happy to discuss this in greater detail with you. Um, I'm not sure I exactly understand what the issue is, but um, I can have my staff contact you and um, learn more. We, we certainly very supportive of CDFIs um, and want to make sure that they can become established and receive um, the, all of the, the additional funding that Congress has made available. These are critical institutions in um, supporting the provision of capital, especially in low-income minority neighborhoods. Okay, thank you, and I look forward to receiving that information. Sir Chuck Yellen, I'm hearing from those representing credit unions that when they apply for CDFIs uh, funds, some are waiting over six months for a status update on decision on their certification as a CDI. Can you look in, uh, into it, what may be causing the delay in getting timely updates and decision and let us know if this is something that needs statutory relief uh, from Congress or are those, are there other ways that this can be addressed? We'll, we'll be glad to work with you on that and have a look. Okay. Secretary Yellen, uh, with the creation of the interagency law enforcement uh, team, how is it the information that treasures collect being shared with the task force and have you found the creation of the task force useful? I'm sorry, the task force on what? I, I didn't quite catch that. I'm saying, have you found the task force uh, being useful? Did, the, which task force? It kept to capture, uh, well, I'll tell you what, I, I said with the capture, the creation of the intelligence law enforcement team. I'm sorry, are you referring to Klepto Task Force? Yeah, Klepto, okay, okay. have you found that information to be useful? Uh, I, I'm not sure. Oh, the, uh, klepto cap, the Klepto Capture Task Force, is that, is that it? Yes. Th this yeah. was just recently established by the Department of Justice to help us uh, go after oligarchs um, to make sure that we're able to identify and seize their property. And I think they've already um, had notable success in um, seizing some property. And uh, it's going to be an important um, initiative in helping us make sure that sanctions work. OK. With that, Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you very much. The gentleman from West Virginia, Mr. Mooney, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Secretary Yellen, a recent study on Chinese lending by aid data revealed that China has established itself as the lender of first resort for many low-income and middle-income countries. China's lending terms are often less generous than those of Western and multilateral creditors, yet the multilateral development banks are not appealing enough to these countries and they in turn turn to loans from China. Uh, China has financed hundreds of billions of dollars in development projects around the world in the last 20 years. China is not extending their funds to these countries out of kindness. They are using their financing to aggressively expand their influence around the world. So my question is, why is it that so many countries take a Chinese loan when financing from multilateral development banks is available, and what are you doing to change this? So my sense is that many developing countries would much prefer um, high standards, capacity building, um, MDB loans to Chinese loans. And it's not that they prefer Chinese borrowing to MDB borrowing, but that 
they really want to have access to all the financing that's available to them, and they use both. Um, we feel very strongly, and this is part of um, the commitment of the president made to B3W, Build Back Better World, to um, helping developing countries build infrastructure um, in ways that involve sustainable debt, um, transparency, um, high quality lending practices, rather than Chinese, often predatory lending practices. And I think, you know, to make sure that we have that capacity, um, we need to bolster U.S. leadership in the multilateral system and to make sure that we meet our financial obligations to these institutions so they need to be adequately resourced and we don't yet have confirmed executive directors, which is also important. Okay, thank you for your response to that question. As a lead into my second question, I'd like to use our current situation with Russia as an, a good example of why China's influence abroad is, of, is an important issue, very important issue. In response to its aggression in the Ukraine, America responded with sanctions that will isolate and weaken Russia. Such a response does not work if we act alone. We need other countries to join our effort in order to apply more pressure to Vladimir Putin and Russia. So my concern is that with China's growing influence abroad, it would be more difficult to isolate and weaken them in the case of a Chinese military aggression. So Secretary Yellen, how concerned are you that China's lending around the world could interrupt attempts to respond to Chinese aggression? Well, I mean, I, I would say generally I am concerned about Chinese lending around the world. Um, I, I think, as I mentioned, I think often Chinese lending can be predatory and result in unsustainable mm -hmm. debt and influence on countries, and that I would very much like to see the United States and its partners expand, expand our lending um, in ways that diminished China's influence in this space. And of course, it is a way in which China exerts influence um, on um, many countries that um, borrow from it. But we need an alternative and we need to f finance it and um, need, a, need, a, need a response. Thank you. I think in my last minute, I have time for one more question. The Chinese Communist Party is carrying out what is widely acknowledged as genocide of the Uyghurs, and yet only one member of the Politburo has been sanctioned pursuant to the Global Magnitsky Act, and that individual sanctioned during the Trump administration. Why aren't we sanctioning China's top leadership for what they're doing to the Uyghurs? Well, you know, we have put on sanctions of individuals um, who are involved in Xinjiang and um, the, the Uyghur situation, um, who exactly to sanction um, in China is something that's part of broader foreign policy concerns that State Department plays an important role in determining is not just a matter for Treasury. Thank you. I'd just like to close by saying we need to act quickly to stop China's negative influence from growing further. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Gottheimer, who is also the vice chair of the Subcommittee on National Security, International Development, and Monetary Policy, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and thank you, Madam Secretary, for joining us today. The U.S. faces an increasingly complex series of challenges before it, between the Russian invasion of Ukraine, competition with China, and the continued threat of both homegrown and domestic terrorism. It is critical that Congress work together in a bipartisan manner to address these issues. The world is watching our response to these critical issues before us, and it is imperative we act together to demonstrate leadership in such areas as stopping the financing of terrorists and ensuring the U.S. emerges as a leader in emerging technologies. Secretary Yellen, the New Jersey Office of Homeland Security and Preparedness just released its 2022 terrorism threat assessment. The report cited homegrown violent extremists, such as those inspired by ISIS and other extremists, as the top terrorist threat facing New Jersey citizens. What is the Treasury Department doing to combat the financing of domestic terrorists, whether the funding comes from overseas or from U.S. sources? 
And is this a major concern for you and your work? Yes, it certainly is a major concern and we're using sanctions policy and um, other resources to try to um, address this threat. Uh, can you speak a little bit about, if you would, where you see gaps, now that you've been in the job for a bit, where you see gaps in your authority, which we could help address here in Congress? What would be most helpful for you to, to help fight these uh, threats to our country? So, um, you know, generally we have great powers to impose sanctions and uh, to, to, to use them un under president's executive orders um, to address threats that we see. There may be some discrete areas. Um, I think one came up earlier in this hearing about geographical targeting in the case of FinCEN's um, collection abilities, but um, we can work with you and give you greater detail on areas where it might be possible to have our authority um, bolstered, but in general, we have substantial substantial powers in these areas. Thank you, and I, I look forward to working with you on that. If I can move on, I, I've been a strong supporter of establishing appropriate guardrails around the cryptocurrency space that will both protect consumers and encourage innovation here in the United States. This includes my discussion draft, the Stablecoin Innovation and Protection Act, which would establish guidelines on issuing qualified stablecoins. One area I'm particularly concerned about is ensuring that bad actors are not able to use cryptocurrency of any kind to launder money or fund nefarious activities. Can you talk a little bit about efforts Treasury is taking to ensure actors like terrorists or Russian oligarchs are uh, to prevent them from using crypto uh, and, and avoid sanctions regimes? Uh, yes. I know you talked about this a little. If you can expand on that, I'd be grateful. Thank you. Sure. I mean, we, we are aware of the possibility clearly that crypto could be um, used as a tool to evade sanctions, and we're carefully monitoring to make sure that that doesn't occur. But uh, I would say we, we have a, a good deal of authority in this area and um, are using it and will use it. Um, and it's harder on a large scale for an economy um, to actually use crypto to evade sanctions. Um, even, um, you know, large-scale transactions would become um, apparent by those who um, regularly examine the blockchain. We would see that there were large transactions taking place. Um, exchanges, you know, those who use crypto need to get in and out of it um, to uh, buy things in, in hard currencies, and exchanges are subject to AML, CFT um, regulations, so they're part of the financial system that is subject to those regulations. Um, and trying to use crypto on a large scale simply um, we think is something that is not easy to do. So it is a channel we're worried about. Um, we haven't seen significant evasion through crypto so far, but we'll monitor carefully to, and use our authorities that we do have to make sure that this isn't a major um, avenue for evasion. You know, on the, on the crypto space, uh, you might imagine I'm hearing from, like, many members of Congress, from those in the space, both consumer groups, but also, of course, uh, entrepreneurs and, um, and businesses that are developing uh, in, in cryptocurrency. I guess I'm out of time. I will, I will yield back. Thank you. <laughs> Thank the, you. The gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Davidson, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. And Madam Secretary, thank you. Uh, appreciate your testimony today. And I'm just curious, you know, do you believe that pursuing globalization through executive policies are aligned with our goals of promoting an internationally competitive environment through domestic policy? I'm sorry, promoting globalization? Globalization. Through what? Well, I mean, did we sign a treaty or something with Basel? Is there some sort of U.S. Did, it, I, did, did I miss something that the Senate, uh, you know, affirmed a, a U.S. treaty? Uh, with uh, with some of this international global framework. And, and, and the reason I ask, you know, just one of the most recent examples is this global minimum tax imposed under 
OECD Pillar 2, uh, and it says it would protect national sovereignty. Um, your rationale seems perplexing because I'm not sure uh, anyone would think that sovereignty is derived from some sort of international agreement, uh, particularly on tax policy. And of course, in our Constitution, it says all bills for raising revenue uh, shall originate in the House of Representatives. Uh, and so, you know, what's the logic of, of uh, submitting to some non-sovereign international framework well, in, on any, tax policy? Any change in tax law in the United States must be legislated by Congress without without question. So um, there is n no um, agreement that imposes any requirements on so the So just US a coordination, kind of like Basel isn't binding, but we do implement okay. it and kind of gold plate it, for example, not, so, not to conflate Basel with tax policy, but when you talk about bank regulation, prudential regulation, uh, some of the components that are allegedly in these stress tests that even Congress isn't allowed access to and uh, the people submitting to them aren't allowed to, uh, you know, share the results of those, even to Congress who wants to determine whether we have the right regulatory framework in there. A lot of this is coming out of this global cooperation. So uh, what's the nature of well, that? Well, look, you know, we have a global financial system, and for it to be regulated effectively, um, regulatory systems across countries need to be um, coordinated with one another. And supervisors are all asking themselves what's the best way to proceed to have a safe, sound um, I think my, my, my point is, is that it's not a binding treaty of the United it's, States, and it's not a power that Congress delegated that we shouldn't be able to hear candid answers. And so there are big black holes in terms of what we're able to get uh, from this. And I, I just want to follow up on one area in particular, because I think you're saying something that's encouraging here. So in December, you submitted answers to Senator Toomey in response to questions that he submitted for the record. One question pertained to draft guidance issued by the Financial Action Task Force. A particular question asked if Treasury believed in non-custodial services should be subjected to money service business registration in light of FATF guidance that was issued in the fall. In your answer, you stated that the FATF guidance was aligned with prior FinCEN guidance and that neither approach uh, proposed to regulate the technology itself. Rather, you asserted that both FATF and FinCEN guidance were focused on financial activity. Do you still stand by that statement? Uh, I, I believe so. I, I, I don't know if you have something particular in mind that goes against that, but... Well, I don't. I think, it, I think that, uh, you know, my concern is, is you know, picking up on that FinCEN guidance, for example, we introduced a bill called Keep Your Coins, which protects self-custody, and the reason we feel the need to protect it uh, is because, you know, Treasury under Secretary Mnuchin and at points under your leadership have proposed to enter into rulemaking uh, on, on, that would potentially prohibit self-custody, or as uh, the language has been used, self hosted wallets, but it's really self-custody of private property without an intermediary. And, and I guess I wonder, you know, I was really encouraged by your dialogue with Mr. Gottheimer there in terms of your view on, on some of the digital asset space. And I know that you have a speech coming up on that, uh, I think, tomorrow. Uh, but in light of uh, the president's executive order, do you believe that it would be fitting for Treasury or other components of Treasury, such as the SEC, to enter into rulemaking uh, while we're in the midst of that executive order? To enter into a rulemaking? Re rulemaking, speeches, statements of policy or guidance. Uh, should we take those kinds of things as guidance or, or what, in light of the executive order? So the president has issued an executive order asking his government to examine issues connected with um, digital assets. Um, I'm giving a speech tomorrow to describe the executive order and the approach that we're taking, but um, you know, in most areas we haven't come out yet with recommendations. Um, an exception to that is in the area of stable coins where I believe my undersecretary testified to you the president's working group is sufficiently concerned about rapid growth that yep. we did come out with recommendations there. Thank you, and I hope Congress will participate fully, and uh, my time's expired, I yield. The gentleman from 
gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Caston, who is also the vice chair of the subcommittee on investor protection, entrepreneurship, and capital markets, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, Secretary Yellen. Um, I want to, I'd like to understand a little bit about the energy sanctions that we have on Russia and, and the potential sanctions that we could impose, and I'm, and I'm delighted to see that there seems to be some, some strong bipartisan support for, for sanctioning Russians' oil exports. Um, if, I'm, if I'm doing my math right, Russia exported about 4.7 million barrels a day last year. They're about the second largest producer, 11 million barrels per day of production, and somewhere between four and five. I believe they produce about 10 or 11 million barrels a day. Total production, but the exports are, are between four and five. So Some, that's something like that. That, that yes. ballpark. So, you know, we are, of course, a very small take of that import. So what I'd like very to understand small. is that as we're thinking with our NATO allies and others about sanctioning of that, let's call it five, how much realistically can we can we block from the sale in international markets? Can we get the whole five? Can we get half of that? Like, what do you what do we think is the amount of pain we could impose on Russia by blocking those exports? Well, I mean, the United States has banned oil imports. Sure, but we're like a half a million barrels barrels a day. Like, I mean, the the issue with with blocking oil oil exports from Russia is that. Um, many countries, especially in Europe, are very dependent on that oil, and um, we're likely to see skyrocketing prices if we did put a complete ban on oil. And as I s said at the outset, our concern has been in designing sanctions. We want to impose the maximum pain we can on Russia, but also taking care not to impose undue pain on Americans or on our sure. partners. So sure, not, we not all a, realize we wish we were a lot less dependent no, and I'm, and on I'm, oil. And I'm and sympathetic with that, and yes. I'm, not, I'm not trying to ask a politically leading question. I'm just trying to understand, you know, we do have, and I realize natural gas is a bit of a different issue with Germany's situation, but with respect to oil, I mean, I've, I've seen ranges of one to three million barrels a day that the, the civilized world could block, and I'm just... I'm trying to understand because there's there's a big supply demand balance question on the other side, and I'm and I'm wondering as we think both about the the tools we have to block Russia and the global inflationary measures. I, I don't know how to think about that except in saying how many million barrels a day are we going to take off the market. So to the extent that we diminish Russia's ability to export oil and force Russia to keep oil in the ground, which is occurring to a meaningful extent right now. Um, we do want to worry about overall supplies and making sure that they're at least roughly adequate. I mean, that's why President Biden announced um, a release, a major release, of a million barrels a day of um, crude from the Strategic Petro Petroleum <clears throat> Reserve over the next six months in the hope that an expectation that high prices will induce um, firms in the United States and elsewhere is enough time to ramp okay. up production. If we're successful with that, um, it might be possible to um, put tougher restrictions on Russia. Okay, well, m maybe we can follow up offline because I, I don't – the concern I have is that if we're looking at one to three million barrels a day of shutdown, there's no country that has the ability to ramp that up. And of course, the Strategic Petroleum Reserve is a finite resource. Um, and I think we have a lot of things we could do on the demand side, of course, right? You know, I mean, I, I'm, I'm delighted to see the move on heat pumps and things we could do to lower oil use. But I'm nervous about what's there. And I, I would like us to understand if we, on a bipartisan basis, as we should be, are committed to reducing Russian oil exports, then we need to have a really good visibility on what that does to global prices for oil markets and to what degree can we reduce our dependency on those through other measures. Right. Well, the, you know, the um, demand for oil is highly inelastic in the short run. And so... As is the supply. Too, too large a restriction on supply could have very large price effects. And that's what we're trying to uh, balance that... We would ideally yeah. like to impose as much pain as possible on Russia, 
but we need to take account of okay. the consequences. I'm, I'm, I'm out of time, but I'll, I'll send you a question for the record. I've, I've, I've really got the same question about food. But if I look at wheat production and corn production and sunflower oil production, there's the same dynamics there. And I'd, and I'd like same, us to understand how we hurt same Russia is, same and understand the The gentleman's time has expired. You, back. The gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Budd, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank the chair. And thank you, Madam Secretary, for being here today. So considering that one of the topics of discussion today is our effort to counter terrorist financing, I'd like to discuss the fact that the U.S. government has already sent taxpayer money to convicted terrorists. So I sent you a letter on January 11th regarding the revelation that the convicted Boston Marathon bomber had received a $1,400 economic impact payment under President Biden's American Rescue Plan. Now, this was revealed in court filings in the state of Massachusetts. So for background, this is a man who planted a bomb at the 2013 Boston Marathon that killed three people, including an eight-year-old boy. And he maimed dozens more. And he then went on to murder an MIT police officer. So now, as of July 2021, the IRS found that 560,000 incarcerated individuals received stimulus checks. And that totaled $783 million. So, Madam Secretary, my first question is this. Can you provide an updated number on how many incarcerated individuals received stimulus checks from President Biden's American Rescue Plan? Sorry, I don't have that number at my fingertips. I believe that the law required it. Um, this wasn't a matter of IRS discretion. I believe the IRS followed followed the law. Thank you. I want to shift gears just a minute. So can you, rather than how many individuals, can you now provide an updated amount of federal tax dollars that were sent to federal prisoners? I, again, I, I don't have that. I don't have that for you, but um, this wasn't um, a discretionary decision by the IRS. So, so from what we know, at least $783 million in taxpayer funds have been sent to federal prisoners. And that includes murderers, rapists, and terrorists. So, Madam Secretary, does the Biden administration believe it's acceptable that hundreds of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars, three quarters of a billion dollars, taxpayer money, do you think it's okay with the Biden administration that that goes to federal prisoners? The IRS is carrying out the law, and um, this oh. is a law that Congress passed. Well, it's very interesting, and I have the, the yeas and nays here from a March 6th of 2021. It was a Cassidy Amendment, 1162 on the Senate side. And we actually offered, a, it was an amendment over there to block federal money, taxpayer dollars, from going to prisoners. But every single Senate Democrat last year blocked that amendment to the American Rescue Plan that would have prevented these payments to prisoners. So we see that the Biden administration didn't support that. Um, but does the Biden administration support sending taxpayer money to federal prisoners like the Boston bomber in particular? Look, as I said, um, you know, w Treasury is charged with carrying out um, programs that Congress passes, and that's what we're doing. And I don't have an opinion to share with you beyond <laughs> I understand that, but we're, it seems... We're implementing a law that Congress passed. I mean, I'm just as confounded as it's, it seems you are at this, because with the majority in the Senate side, they had the authority to stop it, but did not. Or if they didn't have the authority, why did they support the amendment that would have given you the authority to send that? Uh, the Biden administration, it just seems, uh, was very irresponsible with this, because they could have prevented this, and yet they did not. So I just want to be very clear with you, Madam Secretary. I do not think that federal prisoners should be getting stimulus checks, period. Every taxpayer dollar is sacred and should be treated that way. So I strongly urge your department to do better when it comes to safeguarding taxpayer dollars. I yield back. The gentlewoman from Iowa, Mrs. Axney, who is also the vice chair of the subcommittee on housing, community development, and insurance is now recognized for five minutes. 
Thank you, Chairwoman, and thank you, Secretary Yellen, uh, for being here. It's good to see you today. And I want to start out by thanking you so much uh, for helping the great state of Iowa get the funds that we needed transferred from the state over to Polk County uh, to keep a roof over people's head and how quickly the Treasury Department responded uh, to the request from me and uh, the state to make that happen. It's made a big difference, and I really appreciate it. Uh, thank again, you. I'd also like to thank you as well for yesterday's event where the president signed the executive order and for helping us address that family glitch uh, so that a couple hundred thousand more Americans can get uh, health care coverage and we can lower the cost for others. In states like Iowa, that means a world of difference. So thank you so much for all you do. Thank you for that. We were glad to be able to address that. Wonderful. Well, uh, here's the deal. I know a lot of people, and you're hearing it today, are very interested in how the sanctions are working against Russia. I've heard from multiple folks and in briefings, et cetera, that the sanctions seem to be working well. But as that is basically one of our key tools that we're using right now in this issue, I'd like to hear more from you if you think that those sanctions are working in the way they should and if, if, if they're strengthening uh, what we have in place and if there's any suggestions that you also have. So I do believe the sanctions are having a devastating effect on Russia. Um, Russia's become almost completely isolated from the international um, financial system. It's finding it extremely uh, American and foreign firms um, are leaving are leaving Russia. It's losing access to goods that um, Russians are accustomed to buying and being deprived of. The Central Bank of Russia um, had amassed a war chest of reserves of over $600 billion that they counted on to be able to um, deal with uh, the impacts of sanctions on their economy and to help financial institutions and firms that were badly affected. And our sanctions on the Central Bank uh, jointly with our partners have uh, deprived them of access to um, it, certainly over half of that and another 30 or 35 percent is tied up in gold and other forms um, of, of um, wealth that are not highly liquid. So um, we have um, really deprived them of access to a war chest that they were counting on. We have imposed restrictions on um, exports um, of a wide range of um, equipment that's including semiconductors that are um, critical to uh, Russia's ability to um, continue to build defense and high technology sectors. We have sanctioned um, hundreds of uh, Russian oligarchs and uh, members of the Russian government. We have sanctioned firms uh, in the defense sector, in the aerospace sector, and um, we continue to work with our allies um, to put in place uh, additional, additional sanctions as Putin um, ramps up his horrific um, his horrific crimes in the Ukraine. Just this morning, we announced that we're putting in place full blocking sanctions against Russia's largest bank that has over a third of the assets of the Russian banking system. We're prohibiting um, Americans from investing in Russia and uh, further sanctioning elites. And uh, this is I believe going to have a devastating effect on the economy and already is doing so. So, um, you know, every week we have put in place new sanctions, uh, working as closely to coordinate um, with our partners. We have a huge coalition, countries that have rarely, if ever, imposed sanctions. Um, including Switzerland and Singapore, have joined with our coalition, and um, I do believe that they're working. 
Thank you, uh, Secretary Yellen. That was a, a great overview. I did want to talk about supply chain because of the lockdown in China. I might ask you uh, right over to your office. I'm running out of time, but I appreciate all the work you're doing and the update on the sanctions. Thank, Thank you. you very much. The gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Kustoff, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for calling today's hearing, and thank you, uh, Secretary Yellen, for being here today. One thing I hear from constituents at home, and I think every other member of Congress hears from their constituents is, everything is expensive. Uh, it's just expensive to live today. And there are a lot of factors for inflation. I, I, I get that. I do want to ask you, going back to, going back to the American Rescue Plan before we voted on it, uh, Larry Summers, one of your predecessors under Clinton, talked about the, the package, and, and he said, I'm quoting, he said, I think this is the least responsible macroeconomic policy that we've had in the last 40 years. He's right, isn't he, Madam Secretary? Well, he's not right, and um, I'm sorry I have to differ with his assessment. Um, you have an American economy that is enjoying the strongest job market that we have had in decades. Americans feel confident of their ability to get jobs and to move to better jobs. Um, to think that um, a year, two years after a pandemic struck our country and unemployment was in the double digits, rather than waiting for a decade as we had to after the financial crisis to recover the jobs that we lost. This country is enjoying a 3.6% unemployment rate and has seen the creation of over 500,000 jobs a month in recent months. Americans' financial conditions overall are very strong. Um, if you ask uh, the largest banks in the country that keep track of uh, checking account balances of their customers at all levels of income and Let me wealth. Let reclaim my time, Madam Secretary. To put you on the record, you're saying that people feel good about the economy today. The, the American people feel good about the economy. Well, they're concerned about inflation, and that's entirely understandable. And I'm concerned about it. Because they're seeing the, the highest inflation that they've seen in 40 years, correct? Yes, it, it is. And it, Let me ask it, you about this. Yesterday, San Francisco uh, Fed President Mary Daly was speaking. She was talking about inflation at a 40-year high. She said about that that it, that's as harmful as not having a job. She's right about that, isn't she? Well, American, of course, it erodes um, the ability of households to purchase a wide array of goods and services. So, yes, it is. But remember that, especially for the lowest income Americans, wage increases have been more rapid than inflation. And for pensioners, Social Security Reclaiming my time, the, the wages are not keeping up with everyday goods and services, correct? The, for the, for low-income Americans, on for every average, American. that is not true. For low-income Americans, their wage gains have exceeded that. How about and for middle-class Americans? Are wage gains exceeding... Uh, the price increases or price increases exceeding wage gains for middle class Americans? Well, over the last year, the, the price increases have exceeded the wage gains Thank you. for middle. Let me, let me ask you about sanctions in my remaining time. Uh, a big priority of, of Chairwoman Waters has been sanctions against the Russian oligarchs, I think of, of everybody. And, and we, applaud, uh, we applaud those efforts. As it relates to President Putin, what degree of confidence do you have that any of these sanctions that we've levied have personally touched him or his assets? We have levied sanctions against President Putin. And um, this morning, I believe, we levied sanctions against his daughters. Um, look, did it deter? Did all the sanctions, you know, including those that we've imposed against him and the threat that we told him that we would make this very painful and impose sanctions greater than anything any country had ever seen. Did Let me it ask it another way. Is he invasion? feeling the effect no, of the sanctions? Not. Is President Putin feeling the effects of the sanctions? Do we have is any... Is he what? Is President Putin feeling the effects 
of the United States sanctions that have been assessed against him? Um, I, I don't know personally if he's feeling them yet, but um, Russia is certainly feeling the effects of these sanctions and his defense establishment and other sec critical sectors of the Russian economy are absolutely feeling the effects of these sanctions as they find it impossible, for example, to, to find the parts that they need to keep their automobile factories running and um, to build their war machine and replenish it. Thank you, Thank you. Madam Secretary. I yield back. The gentlewoman from New York, Mrs. Maloney, who is also the chair of the House Committee on Oversight and Reform, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Waters. And thank you so much for being here, Secretary Yellen. As you know, I'm very focused on Treasury's implementation of my Corporate Transparency Act, which will require companies to disclose their true beneficial ownership to FinCEN. This was the most important uh, up-to-date anti-money laundering laws in, in generation, in a generation, and I believe this should be a top priority of the Treasury Department. The law gave Treasury one year to finalize the rules implementing the bill, and that deadline was over three months ago. So far, Treasury has not finalized any part of the rule and has only proposed half of it. This is deeply disappointing, especially because the sanctions on Russian oligarchs have shown the importance of being able to look behind anonymous shell companies to find these bad actors. Uh, and as we speak, uh, Russian oligarchs are busy moving their money out of our reach. And in some cases, they're likely moving their money into the US because they know they can hide it anywhere they want anonymously until Treasury finally finishes implementing my bill. This is not about Treasury having insufficient resources either. I have worked uh, with Chairwoman Waters and my colleagues on the Appropriations Committee to secure an additional $355 million for Treasury and FinCEN, which is more than enough to write the rule. The second half of the rule, which Treasury hasn't even proposed yet, is the most important part because it deals with who has access to the beneficial ownership database and on what terms. So Secretary Yellen, will you commit to proposing the access rule for the Corporate Transparency Act before the end of the month? I can't give you a definite promise on timing. These are extremely complex rules. The, um, it's, there are relationships between the two parts of the rule and they have to be coordinated. Treasury has received very extensive comments on the first part of the rule that it has to consider in preparing the second part of the rule. They're not fully separable. So um, I, I, this is tremendously important legislation. I congratulate you and Congress for passing this. It is a critically important effort. It's very complex. We have to get this right. I, I, can't, I can't agree to a, to a deadline. I'm not positive when. Well, I, I, I'll tell out. you, it is critically important, especially what's happening in the world with Ukraine. And if you can't commit to the end of the month, when will you be proposing the access rail? Can you give us an estimate for when we will be able to see this rule? Well, it's certainly this year, within the coming months. Well, Secretary Yellen, my message to you today is a very simple one. Please speed up the process for the beneficial ownership rulemaking. This is taking far too long, and we need action now, not in a few months, but now. Uh, we don't know who's behind buildings in New York and elsewhere, which are just bank accounts. There are no, li there are no lights in the buildings. People don't live there. They're anonymous shell companies. And law enforcement wants to know, the public wants to know, the Ukrainian people want to know, who, who owns this property 
and we can't get to it until the rules have been made and we are way, way behind and it is an emergency. Now I'd like to move on to the substance of the rule. There are a number of things Treasury could do in the access rule to make the beneficial ownership database, database more usable and more effective for, for the law enforcement and others. For example, making the forms that companies fill out very clear and easy to understand and having companies submit the information on machine readable format. Open Ownership, which is an international nonprofit that focuses on beneficial owner ownership, has a number of additional recommendations for Treasury's database. Uh, Secretary Yellen, what is Treasury doing to ensure that the beneficial ownership database is as usable and effective as possible for the users of the da database? It's been a key consideration since the outset and be glad to give you a briefing on um, what FinCEN is doing on that front. Gentlewoman's time has expired. The gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Gonzalez, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Madam Secretary, uh, for being here today. I um, want to jump right into some China World Bank debt, debt trap diplomacy questions, if I could. Um, so when we think about the developing world and how we can help them develop their economies responsibly and sustainably, um, in many instances, countries in the developing world are choosing between different financing packages. Way too often, they're choosing China and the usurious terms that come along with that. So from a tools standpoint, what do we need either at the IFIs or the DFC to have more competitive offerings for the developing world so that they're choosing our packages over China's and or are we even at the table when these conversations are taking place? So I think we need the multilateral development banks to be adequately financed so they have the capacity to um, offer sufficient financing there's an enormous need for infrastructure investment throughout the developing world. Countries are starved for the resources and many don't have access to private capital markets. So and just to interrupt quickly, is your contention that um, these banks are not funded appropriately? Like the World Bank, IMF, they, they do not have adequate capital to make competitive offerings? Is that what you're suggesting? Um, well, in some cases, they are adequately funded. In other cases, there probably is a need for additional resources. Um, we ourselves are in arrears, substantial arrears, in terms of meeting our own commitments and in terms of trying to generate um, new commitments. Um, for example, we feel very strongly that the IMF's new resilience and sustainability trust can make an important contribution to um, energy security and to um, pandemic preparedness and Congress hasn't given us the authority to lend money to that. Um, if the United States lends, we believe it could catalyze $100 billion um, from a, a group of uh, countries. Got it, and one of the problems I have with not one of the problems, one of the issues I've been working on since I got here is Chinese influence at the IFIs, in particular the World Bank, um, where when I've spoken to previous executive directors of both parties, um, what you hear is often China has essentially bought their influence, or they've, they've more or less bought their votes um, in, in various ways, and, and it makes it very difficult to defeat anything uh, that China wants. And one of the, as a response, one of the things that I introduced and got signed into law was the Accountability for World Bank Loans to China Act. This law has various reporting requirements, but also requires the Treasury Department to advocate for a prompt end to World Bank loans to China. China historically blocks that. Um, according to Treasury, there's been low progress on this front. Why has there been low progress, uh, and what should we do? Well, actually, second question, do you personally believe China should graduate from the loan program at the World Bank? Do I what? Do you personally believe China should graduate from the loan program? I absolutely do, and we've advocated it very strongly. Thank you. Uh, another provision within the enacted legislation um, is a report to this committee on the indebtedness of countries to China through the Belt and Road, as well as the U.S. effectiveness in promoting debt transparency at IMF and World Bank. 
In your estimation, how effectively are we countering China's efforts to engage in debt trap diplomacy and how transparent are they or how, how have we done in terms of getting the transparency we need to report to this committee? You know, transparency is very important. It's a focus of both the IMF and the World Bank and they have taken steps. We all have to try to increase transparency, especially of China, China's lending to these countries and we're not where we need to be on this. Um, you know, China agreed to participate in the common framework for countries with unsustainable debt and hasn't really fully met its obligations there either. And so all of these are Real frustrations. Quickly, um, 20 seconds left. Just want to get you back on the record or something. Uh, you mentioned that at present there's no evidence that the cryptocurrency markets are being used in major ways by the Russians to evade sanctions or launder money related to the Ukraine crisis. Would you just reconfirm that that is what, in fact, what you said? I have, we've not seen major use of crypto as a way of evading sanctions. We will be on the lookout for it. It's early days, but we have not seen that yet. Thank you, I yield back. Thank you. The gentlewoman from Massachusetts, Ms. Presley, who is also the vice chair of the Subcommittee on Consumer Protection and Financial Institutions, is now recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. The IMS surcharge policy imposes extra, often hidden fees onto countries with high levels of debt, and it's been widely denounced by development experts and civil society organizations as an unjust burden and a hindrance to our global economic recovery. Secretary Yellen, um, these fees are coming at the worst possible moment when countries are in the midst of a deadly global pandemic and in desperate need of humanitarian assistance and public health services. Are you worried that the IMF may be undermining the financial welfare and stability of the very places we are trying to support? Um, I, I'm, I'm supportive of the framework that includes IMF surcharges. They're part of the IMF's risk mitigation framework, and I see them as critical to protecting the IMF's resources and really making sure that they can um, play a critical role as a global lender of last resort. Um, you know, we're going to rely on the multilateral development banks and the IMF to provide more resources because of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, and we need to make sure that the proper mechanisms are in place, and I think that these surcharges um, should, should remain in place. Well, Secretary Yellen, uh, respectfully, I, I disagree, and as do uh, 17 other congressional colleagues uh, who uh, sent a letter uh, to you uh, urging you uh, to reconsider uh, in January. And so uh, it's just in, in 2009, even before the pandemic struck, 64 countries spent more resources servicing foreign debts than they did on health care expenditures for their citizens. Um, okay, moving on. Uh, given that Egypt and Armenia have vaccinated less than 50% of their population, is it fair to say that the money these countries are paying in surcharge fees would be better spent on, say, vaccinating their people or addressing poverty? Well, clearly there are many countries that require resources and to address the pandemic, to address downturns in their economy and the adverse impacts um, of the economy and of the, the current global situation. And the IMF and the World Bank and other MDBs are um, providing those resources that are very much needed. So I think the surcharge uh, issue is, is separate and is a risk mitigation a policy that's appropriate. Well, I think the detrimental impacts of these fees is, um, and its government's abilities to effectively combat the pandemic is, is, is not really up for debate. But um, since you're uh, not willing to go on record in saying that you would uh, suspend uh, these fees, would you at least be willing to go on record and say that you would review um, this surcharge policy? 
at least a review of it, just a, a, a some some consideration given the detrimental impacts? Well, we we can look at it and um, meet with you to discuss this issue if that would be helpful. Uh, absolutely, I look forward to that, and we'll follow up. Thank you, Madam Secretary. We have to do everything in our power to end the global uh, pandemic, including eliminating surcharges. Thank you. I yield. Thank you. Uh, the gentle lady yields back. I would now like to thank Secretary Yellen for her testimony today. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit additional written questions for the witness to the chair, which will be forwarded to the witnesses for their response. I ask our witnesses to please respond as promptly as you're able. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit extraneous materials to the chair for inclusion in the record. With that, this hearing is adjourned. <laughs>